Regional Faith meets every Thursday night at the Faith Club at 471. Uh, we would love to have you if you come here, and even if you don't come here. We are an apologetics group that focuses on finding evidence for God in archaeology, science, uh, philosophy, etc. There's a lot of great talks every Thursday night. Uh, we are also doing a, actually I don't know the exact room for it, but we're doing a cool event. We're watching a movie and having the uh, director talk at it. Uh, next week? Next week? Yeah. Next week. <laughs> that is Sorry. I prepared everything else. I forgot to prepare that specific information. <laughs> if you want to find out more about that, afterwards you can look for me or any of the other leaders of regional faith who are scattered haphazardly throughout this room. Uh, Alan is also a great person to talk to. Tonight, giving our talk is Frank Turk, author and speaker. Uh, if you're here, you probably already know his book title, but I don't know if he's an atheist. Everyone, let's give a big hand up for Frank Turk. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to go back to September 29th, 2006. That's when Petty Officer Michael Monstor is a United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Monstor is standing in, on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position next to him. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, kill the Americans. As Monsoor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsoor in the chest, and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying on the roof at his feet will surely die. Monsoor yells, Grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward, chest first, onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsoor is dead. His two teammates receive only minor injuries because Monsoor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors at Monsoor's funeral said, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Monsoor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even listen to the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsoor's High School in Garden Grove, California built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsoor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the SEALs wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, North Island, California, just outside of San Diego, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsoor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet, Zumwalt class. This is Monsoor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsoor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. 
But in today's culture, many people don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. After all, it was written down by religious people. Don't religious people tend to embellish things and make things up? By the way, it's got miracles in it, this account. We don't believe in miracles in it anymore. UT Dallas, we're a STEM school. No miracles. We're just all about science, man. How can we believe in such a story? Well, I actually think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions to discover whether or not Christianity is true. If you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes. And if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. Now that is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yeah. That is actually from our TV show, which is on every Wednesday nights on Roku and uh, DirecTV. It's the NRB Network, 9 p.m. Eastern. It's also streamed on our website, so you can watch it there if you want. We're on radio every Saturday mornings. Here in Dallas, it is on a station low on the FM dial. It's an AFR station. Does anyone know what it is? 90.5, so it'd be 9 a.m., uh, here Saturday. Now, I know if you're a college student, you don't get up until the crack of noon on Saturday. So it's podcasted, too. It's called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And uh, what we do is we cross-examine ideas against Christianity, and we provide evidence for it based on our website, crossexamine.org, right there. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And this is going to serve as our outline here tonight. Why are these the four questions? Well, first question, does truth exist? Why is that important? Because you hear people saying there's no truth. You got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. Live your truth, right? You hear people saying that all the time. If there's no truth, then Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, then atheism can't be true either. By the way, if there was no truth, would you be paying 30 or 40 grand a year to go to college? I think like, aren't you here to learn truth? Isn't that the point? Right? Second question, does God exist? Why is that important? Well, if there's no God, you can't have a word from God. You can't have a resurrection. I hope to show you tonight that there really is a theistic God. That's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things. We're going to look at three arguments for this being. These arguments are in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. In fact, we're going to try and establish point two without any reference to any religious writing. Third question, are miracles possible? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. But I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and even atheists are admitting the data for this miracle. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible, then we want to see if the New Testament documents are accurate enough historically to let us know if one particular event from the ancient world took place, and that would be the resurrection of Jesus. Because, look, if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity is true. Of course, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. Even the Apostle Paul said, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. Forget about it, as we used to say in New Jersey. It's not true if he didn't rise from the dead. In fact, Christianity is a worldview you can check out with philosophical and historical evidence. And if Jesus didn't rise, forget it. And you're saying, well, if he did rise, so why does that prove it's true? Because it means Jesus is God and whatever God teaches is true. Look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody predicts and accomplishes his own resurrection from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says. All right? Now, we could go into a lot more detail than this. We don't have uh, uh, all the time to go through it. So if you want to go further, you can get the book on our website. You can get it on Amazon. On our website, you can also get a 12-part DVD series that goes with the book. And there's another more recent book uh, we've written called Stealing from God. Now, Christians, Christians, this book is not about tithing, all right? 
The subtitle is why atheists need God to make their case. I've noticed that when atheists are arguing against God, they're actually stealing aspects of reality that would only exist if God existed in order to say he doesn't exist. In effect, they have to sit in God's lap to slap his face. Now, we don't have the books here, but I want to send you the entire PowerPoint presentation I'm going to show you, and even slides I can't show you due to time. All you need to do is text the word evidence to this number, 855-909-0582. 855-909-0582. That goes for folks in the live stream, too. If you want this PowerPoint presentation, text just the word evidence to that number, and we'll send it to you. And I'll put that up at the end, too, all right? But what we're going to do right now is we're going to start right here at point one, does truth exist? You guys ready to go? Hey, hey! before we get going, I want to thank somebody here, other than the folks who brought uh, me to here, Hayden and Alan and the entire Reasonable Faith team. But you see Officer Jones back there, 25-year veteran of the Dallas Police Department. Now he's working here. Give him a hand for being here. Thank you, sir. All right, let's start talking about truth. And later, we're going to get to Q&A at the end. Actually, that's really not true. I think tonight, we're going to do all Q, no A. All right? So everyone gets to ask a question. It takes all the pressure off me. All right? No, no, we're going to do Q&A a little bit later. All right? So let's start here at point one. Does truth exist? And whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. Right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand. And he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> UT Dallas. He didn't say it that way. If he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. You can't handle That's not how he said it. Here's how he said it. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try it again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now that felt better, didn't it? Didn't that feel better? I mean, that was great. That was worth coming out here tonight just to say that, huh? Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Well, if you don't get anything outside of what we talk about here tonight, um, this next five minutes is it's certainly the most important thinking skill I've ever learned. And whether you're an atheist or a Christian, it's going to be valuable because this thinking skill is going to help you avoid error. And half the battle in our society is avoiding error. If you can avoid error, then you can concentrate on really what's true. And this one thinking skill will help you do it. And the best way to show you this thinking skill is to give you an example of using it. Suppose someone were to come up to you and say, there is no truth. You should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Yes, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true. Did I say that right? Can everyone see that this is a self-defeating statement? What's a self-defeating statement? A self-defeating statement doesn't meet its own standard. A self-defeating statement violates the law of non-contradiction. It would be like if I said I can't speak a word in English. What would you say? Yes, you just did, right? Or it would be like saying my parents had no kids that lived. Or my brother is an only child, right? These are self-defeating statements. And if you can get good at recognizing self-defeating statements, it's going to save you a lot of pain and suffering. Why? Because if you start living by false principles, pretty soon you're going to smack up against reality and it's going to hurt. And here's the tactic. Here's the thinking skill that if you get a handle on, you'll become fearless in identifying false statements. Here's the thinking skill. All you need to do is turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself, and you say, is that true? All right. Let's do a few more of these. Suppose someone were to say to you, all truth is relative. You could say even that one, right? Or you could just ask, is that a relative truth, right? Because this is an absolute truth claim claiming all truth is relative. Now, sometimes people are not going to come out directly and say there's no truth, or they're not going to say all truth is relative, but this is very common today. They might say there isn't the truth, only my truth, right? I mean, this sounds like Oprah, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds so good, right? 
Yeah, you should just live your truth. I'll live my truth. What's the problem with this statement, though? In fact, if you turn the claim on itself, you should ask this question. Is that just your truth or is it the truth? You see, because if this up here is just your truth, then it's just your opinion. Why should I believe it? But if you're saying this truth up here is the truth, you just got done telling me there is no the truth. This is self-defeating. Now, I know this is unpopular in our day to say there's no such thing as your truth or no such thing as my truth. But that's the truth. There isn't your truth or my truth. There's just the truth. Suppose you hire somebody and, and they say, um, uh, I worked for you for uh, 15 hours and you agreed to pay me $10 an hour, so you owe me $15,000. You go, wait, wait a minute, that's not right. Oh, yes, it is, because I have my own math. <laughs> what would you say? Oh, yeah, sure, you got your math, I got my math. No, there's not your math or my math, there's just the math. The same thing is true when it comes to truth. Now, sometimes they won't say it this way. Sometimes they might say it this way. It's true for you, but not for me. Now, if somebody says this, what would you say back to them? You could say even that, but this is also self-defeating. It's just a little bit more subtle. If somebody says it's true for you, but not for me, you may want to ask, is that true for everybody? It's true for you, but not for me, true for everybody? Because if true for you, but not for me, is true for everybody, then true for you, but not for me, can't be true, because it's true for everybody. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But that's because it's self-defeating. It's like saying, I can't speak a word in English. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you, but not for me, say, sure, go try that with your bank teller. Yeah, go to your bank teller and say, I'd like $100,000 out of my account. The bank teller says, uh, I'm sorry, you only have $6.12 in your account. It's very easy to get the money. You simply say, ha, that's true for you, but not for me. Give me the hundred grand. You going to get the money? No. If it's true there was only $6.12 in your account, that's true for all people at all times, at all places when referring to your account at that time. It's just true. Or let's say we're going a little fast down Highway 635. Officer Jones sees you, pulls you over. You were going 100 miles an hour. He walks up to the car, knocks on the window. You put the glass down. He says, you were going 100 miles an hour. It's easy to get out of a ticket. You say, Officer Jones, that's just true for you, but not for me. <laughs> Have you ever heard that excuse, Officer? No, you probably haven't heard that. It's true for you, but not for me, right? If you were going 100, that's true for all people at all times in all places when referring to you at that time. It's just true. Now, I, I go to a lot of churches, and many times I'll ask people at these churches, do you think Christianity is true? And, of course, most people will say yes, and then I'll ask them why. Do you know what answer I get more than any other? Because I have faith. Is that a good answer? Does your faith change whether or not God exists or Jesus rose from the dead? Does your faith change to think about those things? I mean, do you have to believe something to make it true? Do you have to believe in gravity to stay on the ground? Do people who don't believe in gravity float away? Hey, look, there's another one. Hey, if you believe, you'll come back. No, that's not the way it works. You say, well, why is the Bible always talking about faith then? Because there's two kinds of faith. There's belief that, and then there's belief in. Belief that is getting evidence that God exists, that Jesus rose from the dead. That's what we call in this world apologetics. Doesn't mean we're saying we're sorry. It means we're giving evidence that something's true. But all the belief that in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. For that, you got to go from belief that to belief in. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called? You guys are sharp tonight. James said, even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you know intellectually that if demons exist, they know that God exists better than we do? Right? But they don't trust in him. Why? They don't want to trust in him. Because there's a difference between belief that and belief in. You can know something's true and not accept it, right? And we know this in relationships, don't we? When I first met my wife 36 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife. But all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. <laughs> That's the difference between belief that and belief in. Now, most of the time when the Bible's talking about faith, it's talking about belief in. After you know that it's true, trust in it. 
Faith is not blind. Faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe is true. Trusting in what you have good evidence to believe is true. Everybody has some measure of faith regardless of what your worldview is. You're trusting in what you think you have evidence to believe is true. The question is, what is true? Uh, how about this? You've probably heard this. There's no truth in anything but science. Have you heard this at UT Dallas? What's the problem with this claim? Well, you could ask that, or you could just turn the claim on itself and say, is that a scientific truth? Right? This is not a scientific truth. That's a philosophical claim. You can't get to that by doing science. In fact, you can't do science without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy. In fact, I know this may be a bit of a shock. All disciplines are built on philosophy. When you get a PhD, what does the PH stand for? Philo not ph phenomenally dumb. It stands for philosophy of biology, philosophy of chemistry, philosophy of history, whatever it is. You can be a philosopher and not a scientist, but you can't be a scientist and not a philosopher. Why am I saying that? Well, look at it this way. All, let me say it a different way. Science doesn't say anything scientists do. Science doesn't say a word. There's a chapter in our book, uh, Stealing from God. The title of the chapter is Science Doesn't Say Anything Scientists Do. Why? Because all data needs to be gathered. All data needs to be interpreted. Who does that? Scientists do that. Do you ever wonder why you get conflicting advice on COVID? You ever wonder that? Why is that? They, people say, well, let's follow the science. Which science? Whose science? One guy says this, another guy says that. Who's right? You've got to look at the evidence and try and discover who's right. Because science doesn't say a word. Scientists say things. If there was nobody to, to analyze or interpret the data, there'd be no such thing as science. How about this? You hear this too. You ought not judge. This is probably the granddaddy in our culture, right? You ought not judge. What's the problem with the claim? Turn the claim on itself. Yeah. Isn't that a judgment? This is a judgment. In fact, when someone says you ought not judge, you ought to put your hands on your hips and say, then why are you judging me for judging? <laughs> See, everybody makes judgments. You say, wait a minute, Frank. Didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope, never said it. Sure he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. All right, I know this is going to sound a little bit weird here, but it's true. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. Do you think when Matthew's writing his biography, which we call a gospel, he said, well, here's chapter 7, verse 1. No, when were the chapter and verse divisions put in? About 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is a good thing, right? It's a really long series of books. It would be really hard to find your way around. Imagine you go to church one Sunday and the pastor says, you had no numbers in your Bible. The pastor says, let's go about two-thirds of the way in. Let's see if we can find the same spot. No, no. <laughs> You need numbers in order to find stuff. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can take it out and make it say whatever we want. We can't do that. We've got to see the context. What does Jesus say in Matthew 7, 1 and following? He says, judge not, lest you be judged by the same standard you judge others. You be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite, which is a judgment, by the way. Take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be better able to help your brother. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, if you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. Don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, and then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made a hundred judgments just getting over here tonight. Good choices from bad choices. Safe choices from dangerous choices. In fact, now you're, you're thinking, was it a good judgment to even come here? This guy's kind of crazy. I mean, everybody's making judgments. Atheists make judgments. What judgments do they make? There's no God. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The Bible's not telling the truth. There is no purpose or meaning to life. When you die, you're going to become worm food. It's all meaningless. Have a nice day. These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? 
I will say this, though. Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? What was their job? They were judges. They were religious and political leaders of Israel who ran Israel because the Romans delegated much of the day-to-day -day lawmaking authority to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, on whom the Pharisees were. So they were the religious politicians of the day. And Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip, and he goes and he jacks people up in the temple. What? Sweet and gentle Jesus did this? Yes! And then in John chapter 8, he's talking to these same Pharisees. He's having a bit of an argument with them. And right in the middle of the argument, he says, Your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ. <laughs> Can you imagine you have an argument with somebody and you stop and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, okay? <laughs> and then in John, I mean, Matthew chapter 23, he's talking to these same Pharisees, these same political religious leaders, and he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs. But on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney. Can't we all get along, boys and girls? No! I came to bring a sword. It's going to divide father and son, mother and daughter. Jesus was tough. By the way, why was he killed? Do you think he was killed for skipping around saying, love your neighbor? No. He was killed because, number one, he claimed to be God, which was blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. And, number two, he spoke truth to power, particularly the temple authorities who knew that if he succeeded, they'd be out of a job. This is why Caiaphas, after he knew Jesus had resurrected Lazarus from the dead, say, it's better that one innocent man die than all of Israel perish. He knew he was the Messiah, and he wanted him dead anyway. So don't buy into this idea you can't make judgments. Everybody makes judgments. And don't buy into this idea that Jesus was some sort of wimp. He wasn't. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging. Do you ever notice that when you compliment somebody, which is a judgment, nobody gets upset? <laughs> you know, it's like you say to your best friend, I really love you. You're such a wonderful person. I wish you could be like you. You think your friend's going to say, well, who are you to judge? <laughs> right? Your friend's never going to say that. I've noticed that people don't have a problem with judging. They just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact... If you tell somebody something that's true and they get mad at you, you just help convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. A few military people in here, and by the way, I was in the Navy, which stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> for you military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. In other words, if you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. Jesus said men love darkness rather than light. We don't want people exposing us, exposing our evil deeds. We'll, we'll lash out back at you when you do that. We all do that, don't we? People we love the most tell us something that's true and we get all mad because we know it is. We don't want it exposed. Now, we could spend more time on this. We don't have time. So I just want to see if we can get the overall gist of this section. Can everyone see that this statement, and the other ones that we've made, can everyone see that this statement shoots itself? Can everyone see that? Okay. To say there's no truth is a true claim. So to say that there's no truth defeats itself, which means this. If our reasoning is good to this point, relativism and postmodernism are false. 
because they, says, they say it's true that there is no truth. And you wouldn't even be in school if there was no truth, quite obviously. Of course there's truth. The only question is, what is true? So you can't get away from truth. Actually, you, you can get away from it temporarily. How do you do that? You suppress it. In fact, a little bit later when we do Q&A, I, I may ask you a question, especially if you, you're not a Christian. I may ask you this question. It's not fair of me to do that unless I tell you what the question is in advance. So here it is. If you get up to the microphone, I may ask you this question. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no! No? How's that reasonable? I thought you said you were reasonable. It's not. The problem isn't in the head. The problem's in the heart. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God of their own lives. See, many of us, we're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. And we're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun things. But over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in this room who's over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves, right? You want to get contentment? You've got to go straight through truth. And Jesus is the truth. Now, by the way, it's a fair question for an atheist to ask. If Christianity wasn't true, would you stop believing in it? Because this sword cuts both ways, doesn't it? Are we just believing something because we find it attractive? Or is it really true? Well, let's see. Let's go to the next question. Is it true that God exists? And I mentioned there are three arguments we want to look at for the existence of God. The first argument is the argument from the beginning of the universe known as the cosmological argument. Cosmological is a Greek word, or cosmos is a Greek word meaning... Uh, cosmos that the world exists and cosmological is just saying if the universe had a beginning the cosmos had a beginning it must have had a beginner the second argument is the argument from design known as the teleological argument telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose and it says if there's design in the universe and design in life there must be a designer now these two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them we'll see some of that here shortly the third argument doesn't have any science behind it because it's more of a philosophical argument, yet it's the argument we've all known since we were very small children, and it's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then everything's just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion or your opinion against, say, Hitler's opinion. Well, we know torturing babies and murdering people isn't just a matter of opinion. It's really wrong. If that's the case, there must be a standard outside of ourselves, an infinite standard of righteousness that we're obligated to obey. But we'll get to that later. We've got to start here at the first argument, the cosmological argument. Now, you got to admit, it was worth coming here tonight just to see God do that. Did you see that? Some of you are saying, I've never seen God move. Oh, really? Check this out. Look at that. Now, this is the argument that many say points all the way back to the big... Now, I know there's some Christians in here going, uh, you know, Frank, we're Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists have been admitting it. Stephen Hawking, who, as you know, was probably the most well-known physicist in the world until he died about four years ago, put it this way. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another explanation other than God. He failed, but he's admitting the data that space, time, and matter literally had a beginning out of nothing. Agnostic uh, cosmologist uh, Alexander Vilenkin from Tufts University, originally from Russia, put it this way. He said, with the proof now in place, cosmologist, by the way, a cosmologist is not someone that puts on your makeup, all right? Cosmologist is, studies the, is someone who studies the universe. Cosmologist can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, there's a couple of interesting words in this quote from Vilenkin, who's an agnostic, as you can see. First word is the word proof. 
unusual for scientists to use the word proof because science by definition is tentative. Things can come along later and change it. The problem for Vilenkin is, is he sees so many lines of e evidence converging at one conclusion that he's calling it a proof that the universe had a beginning. The other interesting issue is the word problem. Why is it a problem that there's a cosmic beginning? Because if there's a cosmic beginning of space, time, and matter, all of nature, whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter. There must be something that transcends space, time, and matter, something we would call supernatural, beyond, the, beyond nature. Like we call superman means beyond the man, supernatural means beyond nature. Now, we're not going to go through the evidence here tonight. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book, chapter three. And number three, it's not controversial that the universe had a beginning. The only question is what caused the universe to have a beginning? So let's just jump to the bottom line. If the universe had a beginning, it seems it must have had a beginner. We've got two options. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? That someone created something out of nothing or that no one created something out of nothing? Yeah, number two. I was at Texas A&M. <laughs> Aggie mating call. <laughs> Must be like 15 years ago. I put this slide up and one atheist in the audience said, well, I think number one is more reasonable. I said, number one, time out. Let's look at number two for a second. Number two says, someone created something out of nothing. Now, that's a miracle, right? But at least you got a miracle worker. You got someone. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. By the way, do you realize that given the evidence, everyone believes in at least one miracle? Like we're having a fire alarm right now, aren't we? Or do I just have a brain tumor? Oh, Amber Alert. Oh, OK. It'll be in Tulsa? Let's, hey, Officer Jones, get on that, will you? <laughs> Come on. Um, where were we before the Amber Alert? Someone created something out of nothing. Anyway, I, I, said, I said that everyone believes in it one, at least one miracle. Christians believe in more than one, but we believe at least that someone created something out of nothing. Some atheists are now believing that no one created something out of nothing. That's a miracle with no miracle worker. Which one takes more faith, do you think? In fact, at A&M that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality. And by the way, the law of causality doesn't say everything has a cause. The law of causality says everything that comes to be has a cause. There has to be an uncaused first cause somewhere. It's either the universe or something outside the universe that is the uncaused first cause. Because you can't create yourself. There has to be something that's eternal. You can't go on an infinite regress of causes. So I said to the folks at A&M that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, that things don't come into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. There is nobody in this auditorium here tonight who is currently worried that a hippopotamus has appeared out of nothing, by nothing, in your dorm room and is currently pooping on your pillow. Right? You don't worry about that. Why? Because you don't worry that things pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. You're not worried that a raging Bengal tiger is just going to appear out of nothing right here in this auditorium and start devouring people. And if, things could, if the whole universe popped into existence out of nothing, why doesn't everything do so? Why don't Teslas pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? You wake up one morning, you look in your driveway, your Hyundai is a Tesla. And you go, how do I charge this thing? All right. Why don't MacBook Pros pop into existence out of nothing, buy nothing without a cause? Could have saved me like four grand. If you're hungry after this and you want to have a pizza, does it make sense to order one? Or should you just sit in your dorm room, wait and hope one pops into existence out of nothing, buy nothing without a cause? No, you ought to order one, right? Seems to me the atheists have all the faith. In fact, here's a question to ask an atheist. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? This was a famous question posed by Leibniz a couple hundred years ago. If there is no God, why does anything exist? Seems like the universe had a beginning out of nothing. Now, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. The argument doesn't say God did this. It's the implication of what we discover that says it could be God. Because if space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing, then whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial,
powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create. Why personal? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice, and only persons make choices. The being would also have to be intelligent to have a mind in order to make a choice. Now, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, well, Frank, how do you know it's the Christian God? We don't. Yet. I mean, this could be Allah or some other generic theistic God. We don't get all the way to Jesus with this argument, but it could be the Christian God. In fact, if we keep going through the questions, I think the most reasonable conclusion is, is the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,989 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. But we haven't gotten there yet. We have six arguments or six lines of, or I should say six attributes of this being from this argument, but we don't know if it's the Christian God yet or the Muslim God or some other theistic God. But if we keep going through the evidence, I think we can conclude it is the Christian God. Next argument, the teleological argument. And there's two aspects to this. One aspect is, is that the universe appears to be designed. The second aspect is, is that life appears to be designed, you. Let's look at the universe first. And in recent decades, the uh, scientists have discovered that the universe is extremely fine-tuned to support life here on Earth and even fine-tuned to have a universe at all. In fact, uh, Alan Hainline right here, who runs Reasonable Faith, is an expert on the fine-tuning argument, and I'm sure he's given you lectures on that before. I'm just going to give you a highlight of it right here. And this argument says that there are so many factors about our universe that if you were to change any one of them virtually imperceptibly, there would be no universe or certainly no universe that can support life. And even people like Stephen Hawking admitted this. Hawking said famously this, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million, a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. If the expansion rate was that infinitesimally different from the very beginning, we wouldn't be here. Now, you can't make sort of any evolutionary explanation for this. You can't say, well, maybe the expansion rate evolved to this point by chance. Why? Because this is one of the initial conditions of the universe. It started there. Seems to me the same being that created space, matter, and time is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be for us to be sitting here today. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power, we wouldn't be here. What's 1 in 10 to the 40th power? That's 1 part in 1 with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I. Let me give you an illustration. Take a tape measure and stretch it across the entire known universe. That's a long way. Set the gravitational force at a particular inch mark on that tape measure. I realize gravity is not measured in inches, but this just gives you a scale idea in your mind. If the strength of gravity were different by one inch in either direction across the scale as wide as the entire known universe, we wouldn't be here. That's 1 in 10 to the 40 precision. I don't have enough faith to, to believe that that value just landed there by chance. And by the way, is chance a cause? Does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance. He was just here. No. Chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance doesn't do anything. When scientists use the word chance, you know what they really mean? That's what they mean. We don't know. They're using the word to cover their ignorance. Look, there's only two possible reasons for that value being where it is. It was either designed to be there or it wasn't designed to be there. What makes more sense? Somebody designed it to be there. Now, it's not just our universe that appears to be fine-tuned. Our solar system appears to be designed with us in mind. Let's take a quick look at the solar system here. Here we are, third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is? That's a lie. It's way too cold here tonight. The axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees, change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours, change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us, change that slightly, we don't exist. 
If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here on Earth. Why? What does Jupiter do for us? Yes, Jupiter's gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, these dark marks here are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Same thing is true with Saturn. In fact, let's take a look at the planets here. You got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. <laughs> and by the way, what if Pluto identifies as a planet? Right? What then? Bigots. Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun over here. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto? Forget about it. All right, keep an eye on Arcturus here. Where's Arcturus now? Way over here next to this white regal star. That's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. And that's just in our galaxy. This is not outside our galaxy. This is inside our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles. And all that distance is necessary for us to exist here safely on Earth. Now, 30 trillion miles, how far is that? Far. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius <laughs> to go 30 trillion miles. A number of years ago, my wife and I took our sons, when they were smaller, out to the Desert Museum in Tucson, Arizona. If you ever get to go to Tucson, go south of the city, over the mountains. And if you go to the Desert Museum at night, if it's a clear night, you can see thousands of stars in the sky. So we're out there one night, and the guide says, it's so clear tonight that if we look up at 9.03, we will see the space shuttle in orbit. It was up that time. I said, oh, come on. We're not going to see the space shuttle. It's only 120 feet long. It's 350 miles up. We're not going to see it. Oh, me of little faith. At 9.03, the guide goes, look! And we look up in the sky. There's an object streaking across the western desert sky relative to us about like this. I mean, it's really cooking. When it got right about here, it disappeared. I don't know whether Scotty beamed it up or what. Actually, what happened was, despite the fact that we were in total darkness, the space shuttle was so high up that the sun was still reflecting off of it, and when it got out of the range of the sun, we couldn't see it anymore. Now, when the space shuttle was in orbit, the space shuttle was traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to work in the morning? Take the space shuttle! You'll be at five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away in our galaxy, 30 trillion miles. In other words, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles if we could go five miles per second? How long do you think it would take us? 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star inside our galaxy, an average distance away, you've been going five miles per second for 2,000 years. You would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. We can hardly get out of our solar system. We're not going anywhere in space. In fact, 
We could, we, we could never get to another planetary system, but let's say we could. Really, it's too far and too dangerous. But if we could, what would happen? Now, this is, this is a little bit, little bit disturbing, but I'm going to show, show it to you anyway. Imagine if we figured out space travel. We got to another planetary system. We got out of our spaceship. We planted our flag, and then this happened. are not for astronauts, ladies and gentlemen. Now, to show you how analytical my wife is, I showed her that video, and after it was over, she smiled just a little bit, and she said, that's illogical. There's no sound in space. <laughs> now, how many stars are actually in the universe? Well, it's interesting. The psalmist says this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those that fear him. How high are the heavens above the earth? How big is this universe really? Well, the Hubble Space Telescope has helped us discover that. Back a number of years ago, they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on 1 26th millionth of the sky for like 11 days. 11 days of exposure time. This is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. What's 1 26 millionth of the sky? Go out tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up at arm's length. That piece of rice represents about 1 26 millionth of the sky. What did they find? I'm going to show you what they found. I don't know if you can see this, but on the bottom of this slide, these are mountains down here, right? This is the southern hemisphere. And they trained their camera on this one little speck in the sky, and they discovered something pretty shocking. In fact, what you're going to see is a series of photos, and it's going to zoom in on the ultimate photo, the 1 26 millionth of the sky. There is no audio. It's just video. It's only a few seconds long. When I show this video, you're going to see the constellations come up, and then Hubble's going to zoom out to this one little speck. This is called, again, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. You can Google this. This is in the public domain. You ready? Here we go. There are the constellations. What you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies in 1 26 millionth of the sky. And how many stars are there in the entire universe? Researchers at the University of Hawaii think they figured it out. The number of stars in the universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches, on all the earth, times 100,000. And to go from one star to another star just in our galaxy will take you over 200,000 years at five miles per second. Now you know why the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. In fact, how do we know that God exists? Someone will ever, ever ask you that? You know what you ought to say? I know God by his effects. If there's a creation, that's the effect. There must be a creator. That's the cause. If there's design, that's the effect. 
There must be a designer, the cause. There's a moral law written on your heart. That's the effect. There must be a cause, the moral law giver. If you have the ability to reason and ascertain truths about the world outside of your skull, that's the effect, reason. There must be a cause, a mind. If there are natural laws that are fine-tuned and orderly, that's the effect. There must be a cause, an orderer. What must the cause be like if the effect is equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 earths separated by thousands of years at five miles a second? In fact, the verse I put up earlier wasn't complete. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has he removed our transgressions from us. This same being that not only created, as we'll see here in a minute, sustains the universe, is the same being whose love is infinite to the point where he would sacrifice himself to separate your unrighteousness from yourself. Now, when you look at all this, does it make you feel insignificant? Yeah, it shouldn't. Why? Because as amazing as the heavens are, they're not made in the image of God, but you are. In fact, this is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, vi mineral, vegetable, or human? Human. In fact, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. Okay? When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States. <laughs> 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won! <laughs> That's right! Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limping here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool, but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter genome your DNA, your program that makes you you, all the letters in the right order. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of your genome, the 3.5 billion letter software program that makes you you. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. Do you know you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now? Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank, time out. You can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this. This was the subject of our first book, creatively titled, Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. All la laws declare one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law which doesn't legislate someone's moral position. The question isn't whether or not you can legislate morality. The only question is, whose morality will you legislate? In fact, when people say to me, don't impose your morality on me, I say, why not? Would that be immoral? See, because you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots, yet you're imposing this ought not on me. 
Actually, the better answer is, is this. If somebody says, don't impose your morality on me, you ought to say, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong, that rape is wrong, that abortion's wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men. And the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles and have the law of the law written on their hearts. Everybody knows this morality, but some people just don't like it. In fact, you, if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For mosty, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others heart cells, others lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what it needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million. Knock it off! I mean, are you thinking about this? How is this happening? Are you going, wait a minute, Frank, time out. I got to make some new red blood cells. Coming up. No. <laughs> this is all just happening automatically. How so? Well, Aristotle discovered something 2,400 years ago. He didn't know anything about blood cells, obviously. But he noticed that all of nature is going in a direction. You ever notice that an acorn, if it's properly nourished, will always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree? or a birch tree, or a seahorse. You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Yeah, well, who programmed it? And is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No, but it, it reliably goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and it doesn't, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. This is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God, that all of nature's going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be a director, my term, not his. This is called final causality. If things are going in a direction, somebody must be directing it. You ever ask yourself, why is everything so orderly? Why do things go in a direction consistently? Now notice, this is an argument for God. This is not a big bang cause, God. This is an argument for a director every single second the universe exists. This is a right now cause. In fact, Aristotle mistakenly thought the universe was eternal, but he said you still need an unmoved mover to keep everything going. If that's the case, then we have evidence for God every single second we exist. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What would happen the second the band stopped playing? Music's over. Same thing is true with God. God creates the universe. He creates you. He creates the natural laws that drive it. He keeps them going. If he were to pull his hand away... Metaphorically, we'd go out of existence every single second. This is why the Apostle Paul comes along and he says, in him we live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. The writer of Hebrews says that God sustains all things by his powerful word every single second of existence. By the way, the best arguments for God are actually not the ones I'm showing you. The best arguments for God are philosophical. This is one of them. But they take so much philosophical 
um, knowledge before you can get to talk about them that you can't talk about them with all that prior knowledge. But if you want a good book on this, get Ed Fazer's book called Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Now, let's talk about our final argument for the existence of God, and that's the moral argument. Let me ask you guys the question. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six? Not just the rules. What do you have to know about the game? You have to know the purpose of the game. The only way you can know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six is if you know the purpose of the game. If there's no purpose to the game, you can't say this play was better than another. If there's no best, there's no better or worse. Now, in football, the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. When players show up on the field on Sunday, they don't make up the rules. The rules are already established. The field's all there. The rules are made by the commissioner and the owners who tweak the rules every year. Now, in the game of football, the rules are arbitrary. They could be different. In the game of life, they're not arbitrary. They come from God's nature. If there's no purpose to life, you can't say there's a right way to play it or a wrong way to play it. Purpose is essential. Without purpose, you can't differentiate. If there's no best, you can't say we're getting closer to the best or further away from the best based on this action. In fact, if there is no God, you can't say the Nazis were wrong. Why? Because if there's no standard or no purpose to life, there's no objective difference between murdering Jews or loving Jews. If there is no God, love is no better than rape. Oh, you may like love better than rape, but that's just a preference. If there's no purpose to life, there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. Things are just different. If there is no God, there are no human rights. I, there's a lot of people in our country rightfully arguing for rights, but some of them are atheists. Do you know if there's no God, there are no rights? Everything's just your opinion. In fact, our founding document pointed this out quite clearly. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were endowed by their government with, no, endowed by their creator. Governments don't give rights. Governments are supposed to protect rights. That's why Jefferson said, if the government fails to protect rights, secure rights, then the people have the right to a new government. That's what the Declaration of Independence was all about. If there is no God, slavery and racism aren't wrong. Neither is murder wrong if there's no God. That's just your opinion. If there is no God, tolerance is no better than intolerance. By the way, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? No, why? Because tolerance is too weak. Christians are commanded to love. You see, tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Love says reach out and help them. And sometimes, in order to love people, you can't tolerate what they do. In fact, we have a confused idea of love in our country. We think love means approval. Everyone in here who is a parent knows that isn't the case. Everyone in here who's a child knows that isn't the case. How many people in here are parents? How many people in here are former children? All right, good. If your parent... If your parent approves of everything you want to do, if you're a kid and your parent approves of everything you want to do, is that parent loving? No. You've got to stand in the way of evil. You've got to say, kid, I love you so much, I'm going to stand in the way of this because I need to protect you. This is why Paul says in the passage, everybody reads at their wedding but nobody obeys, 1 Corinthians 13, that love always protects, that love rejoices in the truth, that love always perseveres. Love does not mean approval. Love means seeking what's best for the other person, and that often means I can't tolerate this. It's going to hurt you. Also, you can't complain about the problem of evil if there's no God. Why? Because if there is no purpose to life and there is no God, there's no such thing as evil. In fact, C.S. Lewis famously thought that there couldn't be a good God because there was too much injustice in the world or injustice. Then one day he had an epiphany and he realized his whole argument collapsed. Here's what he wrote in Mere Christianity about this. He says, as an, as an atheist, 
My argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what injustice was unless you knew what justice was. You wouldn't know something was not right unless you knew if something was right. Something can't be immoral unless something is moral. In other words, evil doesn't disprove God. Evil may prove there's a devil out there, but evil doesn't disprove God because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good, and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. You say, well, how can that be, Frank? Because evil's not a thing in itself. It's a lack in a good thing. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you've got a better body, right? What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? Nothing. doesn't exist on its own. Evil is like rust in a car. What happens if you take all the rust out of a car? You've got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You've got a Pinto. Okay? Right? No, there's nothing there. Things don't exist. Evil doesn't exist unless it exists in a good thing. In fact, you could put it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you've got to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil. But you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. So if evil exists, I know this is going to sound counterintuitive, but it's true. If evil exists, God exists. Not because God is doing evil, but because he's the standard of good by which we'd even know what evil was. Now, we could talk about why does God allow certain evils in the Q&A if you want. But one more thing. Let's go, back to, uh, let's go back to Patrick Mahomes for a minute. What does the word submit mean? What does it mean to submit? Nobody likes this word. Nobody likes submit. But let's break the word down. Submit, submission. What does mission mean? You have a goal. You got a purpose, right? You're going in a direction. What does sub mean? It means you're putting maybe your own personal mission under this other mission. That you're going to devote your efforts to this direction, maybe even though you want to go in this direction. You're, you're putting your will under that mission. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is a God, and I think there is, we would be absolutely foolish to pursue our own personal missions rather than submit our own personal missions to his eternal mission. I mean, go back to football for a second. If I'm some diva receiver on a team and I keep saying, Coach, you got to throw me the ball, throw me the ball, throw me the ball. And the coach says, look, man, if we want to win, we can't throw you the ball every time. we got to spread the ball around. And I say, you know, Coach, you're right. I'm going to submit my personal will to the mission of the team, and you throw it to me when it's going to help the team. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good thing, right? At least you got to throw the ball to him sometime, right? C.D. Lamb didn't get any catches. What, he had one? <laughs> Look, the Cowboys will always disappoint you. <laughs> Jesus never will. Okay? All right. Now, what can we point out from these three arguments? That we have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things, and he's a moral being as well. Now, notice we have all these attributes of God, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. Now, again, how do we know it's the Christian God? Well, before we get there, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, atheists have reasons to disbelieve this. I don't think they have good reasons. Why? Because if their worldview is true, there's no such thing as reason. And nobody said this better than C.S. Lewis. I can't say it better than him, so I'm just going to show you what he said. It's a two-slide quote. Check this out. Suppose there were no intelligence behind the universe. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. Thought is merely the byproduct of some atoms within my skull. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? 
So, but if I can't trust my own thinking, of course I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I can't believe in thought, so I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. To quote the legendary John Madden, boom. You can't say it better than that. You shouldn't even be able to reason if there's no God. But you can reason. Reason's an effect that you have. If it's an effect, you need to reason back to a cause to determine what caused that. Blind natural forces which need a, a cause themselves are not the cause of your mind. And if they were, you shouldn't believe your mind. This is why John Lennox, the philosopher and mathematician from Oxford University, asks his atheistic colleagues, how do you do science? And they normally say, well, I got this machine in my lab. He goes, no, 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 I'm not talking about how you do science in the lab. How do you do science up here? And they say, with my, they start to say mind and they catch themselves. And then they say, with my brain? And Lennox says, yeah, tell me where your brain came from. And they say, well, my brain is the product of random forces that didn't have its end in mind. And then Lennox says, and you trust it? Why would you trust such a device? If a computer could be put together by natural forces, would you trust it? No. There's got to be a mind behind it. So, how are we going to determine who is the true God? For that, we've got to go to miracles because miracles can show us who speaks for God. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on miracles because I want to spend more time on the New Testament. Normally, we spend a little bit of time on this. I'm just going to point out one fact about miracles, and you can bring it up during the Q&A if you want. A lot of people don't believe in God because of miracles. Oh, we haven't seen miracles. Miracles don't occur. The greatest miracle in the Bible is what? It's not the resurrection. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? And here's the interesting thing. Even atheists are admitting the data for the first miracle. They don't think it's God, but when you go through the evidence, you realize that whatever created space, matter, and time, as we mentioned earlier, has exactly the attributes of what we would call God. So if Genesis 1-1 is true, every other verse is believable. Now you might ask, well, why don't we see miracles today as much? Let me just say one thing about that. I think there's evidence that miracles do occur today, but that's not my point. Ladies and gentlemen, miracles have to be rare if they're going to get our attention. If miracles occurred all the time, we wouldn't view them as special acts of God. Imagine if resurrections occurred routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? Nothing. You go to somebody and you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Leroy just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back, right? No, it's got to be a rare event if it's going to get our attention. If miracles occurred routinely, they would lose all their apologetic value. So we can talk more about that later, but I want to spend our time right here on is the New Testament true, okay? And then get to your questions. Now, when we're looking at the New Testament, we're not treating it like it's an inspired text. We just want to see if it's historically reliable enough for us to draw one conclusion, and that is, is it true that Jesus really rose from the dead? And I think there's good evidence that he did. In fact, I'm going to list eight lines of evidence that he did, but we're only going to briefly look at three. They all begin with the letter E, because at one point I was a Baptist, and I need to alliterate everything, all right? <laughs> now, it'll help you remember it. First, we have early sources. These documents are written down early, and the data in the documents is even earlier. We have eyewitness details. I'll explain that in a minute, as well as embarrassing stories and excruciating deaths. Those are the three we're going to look at. Number five is something called embedded confirmation, and I can't explain this in a short period of time. So all I want you to do if you're interested in this, and you should be, because this is the best evidence you've probably never heard, that the New Testament writers are independently witnessing the same historical events, and they couldn't have invented them. What you want to Google are two words. The two words are undesigned coincidences. Undesigned coincidences. There are books written on this. There's even free books you can download on the Internet. And once you see undesigned coincidences, you're going to go, yeah, they couldn't have made this up, all right? 
I call it embedded confirmation. Expected predictions that deals with Old Testament prophecy. In fact, if I hold, had only one Old Testament prophecy to make my case on, it would be Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years before Jesus, and it describes what Jesus did. Also, extra biblical writers. There are 10 ancient non-Christian sources within 150 years of Jesus' life. Household names like Josephus, Suetonius, Egon, uh, and a bunch of others. And while they're not eyewitnesses, they give the same kind of information about what the disciples believed, even the point that the disciples believed Jesus rose from the dead and were willing to die for that belief. Also, number eight, the explosive growth of the church. It's really hard to explain how Christianity could have emerged out of Jerusalem on an empirical claim that Jesus of Nazareth had resurrected from the dead because what's the easiest way to refute that claim? Go to the tomb, take the body out, and the Jews and the Romans were too eager to do that. They couldn't do it. Why? Because Jesus was still using his body. It would have been easy to squash Christianity at the beginning, and they couldn't do it. Now, uh, as I say, we don't have time to go through all these. Let's just spend a little bit of time on eyewitness details. In fact, how do we know we have eyewitness testimony in these documents? I think it's because they put historical crosshairs in the text. What I'm about to read to you is what we call a couple of verses from what is known as the biography of Luke, really the gospel, the good news of Luke, This is chapter 3, the first couple of verses, and as I read this, I want you to think, does it sound like this guy is making up a story? In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Itria and Tractonicus, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. Does it sound like this is a once upon a time story? No, in fact, he's not making up a story because an exact date is given. This is 29 A.D. in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. All eight people are known from history, these eight people listed here. They're known to live at this exact time, and it's not a a once-upon-a-time story. It's not a myth. Luke would have destroyed all of his credibility if he said this and then tried to pass off lies as the truth. It would be like if we were to say right now, uh, in fact, today is the one-year anniversary. It was, it's one year since President Joe Biden was sworn in. And uh, uh, Kamala Harris is the vice president. Nancy Pelosi is the head of the House. Chuck Schumer and uh, Mitch McConnell share power in the Senate. You would know exactly when I was talking about, right? That's what's going on here. In fact, there are numerous eyewitness details in the text For example, in the book of Acts, there are 84 historically confirmed eyewitness details just from chapter 13 to the end of the book. Roman historian Colin Hemmer wrote an entire book on this where he went through every verse in Acts and pointed out how much of an historian Luke was. In fact, Roman historian, um, or I'm sorry, uh, archaeologist Sir William Ramsey put it this way, and this is actually a picture. This is my favorite Uh, spot in the footsteps of Paul Cruz. This is Corinth. There's no modern city built on ancient Corinth. When you go to Corinth, you're standing where the Apostle Paul stood. Anyway, Sir William Ramsey, who was an archaeologist from the last century who did not think that when going into this that the documents were accurate, changed his mind after discovering what he discovered. And here's what he said. He said, Luke references 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands with no mistakes. Well, that's because he had Google Earth, right? No. Luke was there or knew people who were there. Uh, Also, those 84 details, by the way, some of them are obscure. Like Luke has, who was the obscure ruler in an obscure town in the Mediterranean? What was the strange slang they spoke there? What were the weather patterns in the Mediterranean at this point? Luke even has the depth of the water off Malta right. When they run aground, 90 feet, then 60 feet. And uh, they really ran aground in St. Thomas's Bay on Malta. It's not St. Paul's Bay, but that's a whole other story. I don't have time to get into it. 
Luke includes several others uh, of these details in his gospel. Some of them we just read in Luke chapter 3. John, the Gospel of John, has 59 historically confirmed or historically probable eyewitness details in it. Some of it, by the way, all these are listed in chapter 10 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Obviously, we can't go through all these here today. I'm just kind of giving you the overview, okay? Uh, and then the New Testament documents cite more than 30 people confirmed by secular sources or archaeology. One of the things we did in researching the book is we said, you know, there's a lot of names in the New Testament that seem like they're politicians and that kind of thing. Did they really exist outside the New Testament documents? The answer is yes. Here's what we found. You see all these names here? The Agrippas, Bernice, Augustus, Caiaphas. All these people are in the New Testament documents, but they're also outside the New Testament documents, either in other writings or in archaeology. In fact, if you were to add Jesus to this list, it would be 32 because he's mentioned outside too. Look, James, the half-brother of Jesus. John the Baptist is mentioned by Josephus. These are all real people. In fact, the New Testament documents get the bloodline of Herod right. All those Herods, you don't know who you're thinking of, you know, who, you, who you're reading about when you read Herod in the Bible. Is this the father, the son, the grandson? Who is this, right? They get it all right. In fact, how do they know this? Well, there's archaeological discoveries. This is uh, the Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea stone, found in the coastal town of Caesarea. The Romans were no dummies. Their center in Israel was not Jerusalem. They're where they operated out of was Caesarea. Why? It's beautiful. It's on the Med. And that's where this discovery was made about Pilate. Not only did we discover Pilate, we actually discovered the bone box of a man who sentenced Jesus to die. This is an ossuary, a limestone burial box that the Jews used from about 70 or from about 20 BC to about 70 AD. About a year after someone important died, they go in, take the bones out of the grave, put them in this limestone box called an ossuary, and then reinter the remains. There have been hundreds of these discovered around Jerusalem. For those of you that have gone to Israel, you know on the Mount of Olives, you can see some right exposed to the elements, these ossuaries. Well, they discovered this by accident in 1990, this ornate ossuary, and they discovered that the inscription on the side of it was the inscription identifying the remains of Caiaphas, Joseph Caiaphas. The only Caiaphas known from history is the guy that sentenced Jesus to die. Inside were the bones of a 60-year-old man with his family. You can see this if you go to the Israel Museum right across from the Knesset in Jerusalem. This limestone ossuary is sitting on a glass table. Not behind glass, it's just sitting there on a glass table. Now, if you touched it, you'd probably be shot. But there it is, just sitting there. And then right behind it, hanging on a wall, is this. These are the re this is the remain of a remains of a first century crucifixion victim. This is just a mock-up to show you the relative angle of the nail going through the heel bone. This discovery was made, I think, in about 1968. And there's been another one since then. We know crucifixion took place. In Jerusalem, in fact, the reason they couldn't get this bone out of this heel bone is because it bent over here. Normally, they would take the bones or the uh, nails out and use them again. But this one, they couldn't, they couldn't do that. Now, there are so many of these discoveries that what you need to do if you're really interested in this and get this book by Titus Kennedy. Titus Kennedy is a real-world Indiana Jones. In 2018, he went to the Sudan and he slept with the scorpions in order to discover and verify the oldest inscription of Yahweh ever discovered in the world. It wasn't found in Israel. You know where it was found? In the Sudan. Why in the Sudan? Because in 1400 B.C., which is how old this inscription is, that was part of Egypt. And where were the Israelites in 1400 B.C.? Just leaving Egypt in the Exodus. The oldest inscription of Yahweh ever found was found in Egypt because that's where they were. And this, in fact, go to our podcast, listen to a couple podcasts we've had with Titus, and our YouTube channel has a number, a couple of these with Titus as well. He, he uh, teaches at Biola, and he's got a new book coming out next month on New Testament. This is both Old and New Testament archaeological discoveries, but he's about to do one uh, regarding Jesus that will probably come out in a month or two. We'll have him on the podcast as well, okay? That's a brief overview. Now let's go to embarrassing stories. Embarrassing stories. 
what, what's the deal with embarrassing stories? Why is this evidence that the New Testament writers are telling the truth? Because there's a principle that historians use when they're trying to discover if someone's telling the truth. It's called the principle of embarrassment. It goes like this. If there's something embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why would it be true? Because you're not going to invent details that make yourself look bad, right? You might invent details that make yourself look good, but you won't invent details that will make yourself look bad. In fact, let me, get, let me ask you guys a question. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? Put your hand up. Look, if you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying to make yourself look good. <laughs> and it's not working. We know you're lying. All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? No, you don't lie to make yourself look bad. You might lie to make yourself look good, but you're not going to lie to embarrass yourself. Well, the New Testament writers, and this is true of the Old Testament as well, but we're just going to look at the New Testament. The New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing details they never would have invented. They never would have lied to make themselves look bad. That's why we call this the duh factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of these. Notice the New Testament writers depict themselves as dim-witted, right? How many times do they go, we didn't know what Jesus was talking about. We didn't know what he meant. In fact, they really don't get his mission until after he's resurrected and he's ascended to heaven, right? And then at that point, they go, wow, I could have had a V8, right? <laughs> Up to that point, they're, they're, they're ignorant. Peter, their leader, is called Satan by Jesus. Do you think they made that up? Do you think Mark, who wrote this down, at one point said to Peter, hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? <laughs> have him call you Satan. Look, I'm the leader here. This doesn't look good. And then Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He winds up denying him three times. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away! They all run away. Well, who are the brave ones, by the way? The women. That's right. The women are the brave ones. Now, who wrote the New Testament documents down? Men. Now, what man is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man in here invent that? No. If I was there... And I wanted to invent something, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd write something down like this. Let's see, we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. John said, get out. <laughs> Peter, roundhouse, kicked him. Thomas said, we'll be back. No doubt. And then we marched right down to the tomb on Sunday morning, and we saw Jesus, who congratulated us on our great faith, and then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say I was Mr. Sissy Pants, why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never even say that in that culture? Forget about the fact it was embarrassing to men. Why would you never say the women were the first witnesses? That's right, Chris, right? The in that culture... Or James, right? You're James. In that culture, the woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were. I actually had a woman once come up to me and she said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. I said, that is an excellent point. I had not thought of that. Because, ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you the nuke blew up. <laughs> I've been hot for three days. What's for dinner, right? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next verse is in the, in the New Testament, but it is. You know, at the end of Matthew, where Jesus is giving the Great Commission, that, go therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers, by the way. 
disciples there's a difference. Anyway, while he's given this, it says right there in verse 17, his disciples are there, and it says, some believed, but some doubted. What? Some doubted? He's standing right in front of them, resurrected. It's like they're standing there going, see that guy over there? Yep. That guy over there is Jesus. Oh, no, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. Jesus is dead. The Romans killed him. It's him. Look, the Romans know how to kill people. They crucified him. They put a spear in his side. Blood and water came out. I'm telling you, Jesus is dead. It's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. There is even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus. You know, Jesus is considered out of his mind by his own family who want to seize him and take him home. This is Mark chapter 3. You may have heard the scholars say, the New Testament writers embellish Jesus to be God. Oh, really? Then why is Mark chapter 3 in there? Which is almost universally recognized to be the earliest gospel. Why does his family think he's nuts if they're trying to pass him off as God? They're not. Jesus is called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. You think they made that up? He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, notice there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. Who are they? Rahab and Tamar. Do you think when Matthew and Luke did the genealogies, they said to one another, they said, you know what? I really think we should spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in there. Let's see, Rahab, Tamar. No! In fact, there's a lot of embarrassing people in the bloodline of the Messiah. Judah, from where we get the term Jew from, not a good guy. Read about him. David, David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us, huh? Bathsheba's in there. In fact, when, I think it's Matthew, when Matthew gets to her in his genealogy, he won't even mention her name. You know what he says instead? Uriah's wife. Ooh. I mean, he's telling the truth, right? But who is Uriah, husband of Bathsheba, whom David had killed so he could have Bathsheba? He's telling the truth, but he's not sugarcoating it. He's slamming David. Uriah's wife. They're not making this up. By the way, anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse, according to Deuteronomy 21, 23. You think they made that up? They put the Messiah on a tree? But he was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin. We put him under. But if you're making this up, you don't say any of this. This is not a made-up story. Finally, last thing. Excruciating deaths. Not only did these people say that Jesus had resurrected from the dead, many of them died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by, look, by saying, look, it never happened. What we need to remember is the people that wrote the New Testament documents down, all of them, with the exception of Luke, were all Old Testament believing Jews who thought they were God's chosen people, who didn't think a man could claim to be God, that would be blasphemy, and they didn't think there would be a resurrection in the middle of time. They thought there would be a resurrection at the end of time, Daniel 12, 2, but not one in the middle of time. Why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? who claimed to be God. In fact, what did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? What did these people get by saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? What did they get? They got kicked out of the synagogue, and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. Right? We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? First get kicked out of the synagogue, then beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up! <laughs> What a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this earlier? No. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. Sometimes I get the question, if you're a Christian, you might get the question too, are there any non-Christian writers who talk about Jesus and the apostles? I briefly mentioned them before. They're all in chapter 9 of the book. Yeah, there are. But you know what's underneath that question quite frequently is an illicit assumption. What's the illicit assumption? that you really can't trust the New Testament writers because, you see, they were religious people, and religious people tend to embellish things. You can only trust the non-Christian writers to know what happened. If you think about that for more than 10 seconds, you realize how stupid that is. Why? What did these guys have to gain by making this up? Nothing. 
They had everything to lose by making it up. Now, you may know my friend Jay Warner Wallace. He's the cold case homicide detector that's been on Dateline more than any other detective in the nation because he solves murders that are decades old. He's written a book called Cold Case Christianity. He's also written a book called Person of Interest you're going to want to get. And Jim says whenever he finds a murdered body that he knows has been murdered, he says, I know there's only three reasons why that guy's dead. There's not a thousand reasons. There's only three or a combination, one of the three or a combination of the three. There was either a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. Sex, money, or power. Those are the three things that will drive people to murder. In fact, those are the three things that will drive any of us to sin. Why? Because sex, money, and power are great things. They're so great, we'll take shortcuts to get them. So if you're going to say that the New Testament writers made all this up, you've got to have one or more of those three motivators. Sex, money, or power. Ladies and gentlemen, did the New Testament writers get real popular with the ladies for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? No. Did they get money? No, they weren't 21st century prosperity gospel charlatans. <laughs> did they get power? No, they got persecuted. They got the opposite of power. Paul had power as a persecutor of the church. As soon as he became a Christian, he was persecuted. They had no motive to invent this and every motive to say it didn't happen. And then why would they die for a known lie? You might say, time out, Frank. I know there are some people, like some Muslims, will die for their faith. Does martyrdom prove Islam then? No. Why? There's a big difference between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. A lot of differences, but let me just give you one for our purposes. The Muslim martyrs of today haven't witnessed anything. They haven't seen evidence with their own eyes that Islam is true. They just have faith. But the New Testament writers of New Testament times witnessed Jesus rise from the dead. They saw Jesus, they touched Jesus, they ate with Jesus, they verified with their own senses Jesus had risen from the dead. Many people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether, whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. All right, what I'm about to say to wrap this section up is something that's going to probably disturb some of you especially if you think the Bible's inerrant, like I do. But stick with me. It's not heretical. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. You say, how can that be? Because Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection. Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Christian, Frank, how could you be a Christian without the book of Romans? <laughs> was Paul a Christian before he wrote the book of Romans? Yes. Why did he write the book of Romans? Because the risen Jesus appeared to him. That's why he wrote it. You see, Christianity started with the resurrection. It didn't start with a series of books. In fact, we could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't have New Testament documents written by Jews in the first century Bible, Old Testament believing Jews in the old century, in the first century, claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead, unless that really happened. Because they lost everything by saying it was so. And they had no motive to make it up, every motive to say it didn't happen. Now, thankfully, these men wrote it down so we could know about it, but it would be true whether they wrote it down or not. Do you see the point? And you don't need an inerrant Bible to know that Christianity is true. In fact, my friend Gary Habermas, who has written more on the resurrection than any person in history, his magnum opus is now 5,000 pages. He's been teaching at Liberty University for 40 years. 
If someone comes up to him and says, Gary, I found an error in the Bible. You know what Gary says? So? What's your point? Does that mean everything in the Bible is wrong because you think you found an error? That doesn't follow. Even if there were errors in the Bible, it wouldn't mean the central story is false. Now, I don't think there are. But even if that were true, it wouldn't mean that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Now, if you go further in the book, you can see why we think the Bible is the word of God. But we don't have time to go through all this. We've got to get to your questions. Let's sum up the whole thing. Does truth exist? Someone says there's no truth, you're going to say? Someone says, does God exist? We gave three arguments, cosmological, teleological, and moral, which show us, show us there is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator. Are miracles possible? The greatest miracles already occurred, Genesis 1.1. Other miracles are possible if God exists and he can create the universe out of nothing. And is the New Testament telling the truth about the resurrection? We've only looked at three out of eight lines of evidence, and there's other evidence you can look at as well, but it sure seems like they would have told the truth and did. Now, again, if you want to go further, text the word evidence to this number, 855-909-0582. 855-909-0582. And, in fact, I'll put that up here again. We're, we're now teaching online courses, by the way. If you want to take an online course with us, just go to cross-examine, click on online courses. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. We're on YouTube and Facebook right now. In fact, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've combined these three into one social media platform. We call it You Twit Face. <laughs> it's kind of a Jersey thing. Have you signed up for You Twit Face yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah well, we're on Instagram, too, so uh, check that out. Also, the uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast, as I mentioned. We're on TV Wednesday nights at 9 p.m., there's that number again, and if you don't do anything else, download the free cross-examined app, two words in the app store. It's even got a quick answer section on there. It has the podcast on there, streams the TV show, and you're only the second audience. I'm about to tell you about one other thing. My son, who is a career intelligence officer in the Air Force, and I got together. He has already graduated seminary as well. And we put together a brand new book called Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. And we're going through all these movie franchises. Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Lord, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Batman, and Wonder Woman. This book is coming out May 3rd. And if you pre-order it now and you send us in about a month the receipt for that book, we're going to send you the audio version for free. Okay. So this is a fun way to do evangelism and discipleship, to get young people to really recognize that the stories that they love are actually images of the ultimate story and the ultimate hero, Jesus. So check out Hollywood Heroes. It's coming. All right, last thing before your questions. It's true. So what? So what? Christianity is true. Well, you know what this means? Someone actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy many years ago, I was in naval aviation, and we had to uh, earn golden wings, which were fairly hard to earn. But there was nothing more difficult to earn in the United States Navy than the golden trident. That's what the SEALs wore and still wear. Very few people who start SEAL training make it through, 5 10% maybe. Those that do make it through wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery, just outside of San Diego, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that died for them, their Savior. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to put our identity in our Savior, but our culture says, oh, no, no, put your identity in your political party or put your identity in your race. There's only one race, the human race. Or put your identity in your sexual orientation or put your identity in your boyfriend or your girlfriend or put your identity in your bank account or your vocation. None of those things are ultimate, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to get true contentment, you've got to put your identity in your Savior. You know, the only thing you can never lose is God. You can lose everything else. But our Savior didn't just die. 
He actually rose again. And by trusting in him, you can not only be forgiven, but you can be given his righteousness. Look, there's only three things in the end you can get. You can get justice. That's getting what you deserve. None of us want justice. You can get mercy. That's not getting what you deserve. Or you can get grace. That's getting what you don't deserve. All of us should want grace. We want to be forgiven for what we've done, and then we want to be given his righteousness. Have you ever accepted that? Why wouldn't you? It's free. Everyone's going to live for eternity somewhere. The only question is, where? God will respect the choice you make. All right, with that, let's go to questions. And uh, the great Clint Bowen here is going to set up the Q&A mic. Oh, there it is. It's set up right back there. And since no one, since no one likes to ask the first question, let's move right on to the second question. <laughs> and uh, go to the mic there so everyone online can hear you and see you. And uh, anything you want to talk about is fine. Anything we discussed or even stuff we haven't discussed, that's fine too. Let me just uh, go to the uh, other section here. And I'm going to put the slide up again for the, uh, I'm going to put a slide up here uh, for, oops, sorry, for the PowerPoint, text the word evidence to that number. And if you want to take a short survey to comment on what we've done here, type the word event. We'll text you just a couple of questions. So you can help us improve what we're doing here. Yes, sir. What's your name? Dylan. Dylan, go ahead, sir. All right, Frank. So um, I got a lot of questions on here, but I got an actual question for you and then a short question. Go ahead. Um, so how should followers of God post-cross uh, interpret the fear of God that's talked about in the Bible? When I first read the book of Romans, uh, it was kind of scary because there's a lot of strong language in there. But then I also wonder, uh, Christians are we're, you know, free from God's wrath now. Um, that's what the Jesus paid the fine for our uh, transgressions already. So yes. how, what is that? What's that dynamic well, there? I, th I think we ought to fear God because he is absolutely pure and holy and we're not. And even though we've been covered with the blood of Christ and he sees Christ when he looks at us, we should still fear God and his purposes, especially when we're here on earth, because we're not there yet. Right. We're not in the afterlife yet. Uh, and we should respect what he wants us to do. As I said earlier, nobody likes the word submit, but we would be completely foolish if God exists and he has a mission for us to not submit ourselves to that mission. Yeah. Because everything else is just like chaff. If we have our own little mission and it's contrary to God's mission, what for? His yeah. is eternal. Ours isn't. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, and quick question is, yeah. what is something you're looking forward to or hoping that exists in heaven? Like a favorite food or something. Oh. <laughs> For me, it's mac and cheese. Well, to tell you the truth, the only reason I'm a Christian is so I can eat bacon. I hear you. There we go. Classic American. I just I like got to be honest with you. Yeah. All right. All right. Love you, man. Bacon, thank you. Thank you. you. I appreciate it, Dylan. God bless. God bless. By the way, you know, you can make roadkill good with bacon, right? <laughs> Anything, right? Am I right? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Name is Stephen, and hey, Stephen. this question is actually submitted on behalf of my son, who's a freshman at Mississippi State. Mississippi State. And he, he called us last night and said, "Mom, Dad, you got to drive down there." So, he, I think my wife's videoing this. He asked us to ask you this. All right, Doctor Turek. First of all, thank you for helping strengthen my faith through evidence and logic. We know that God is omniscient. How does He observe and know our sins? and yet forgets them when we accept Jesus. Uh -huh. Can you help me understand how God is all-knowing but chooses to not know or remember some things? Yes, good question, Stephen. I think this is what is known as metaphorical language. When it says that God forgets our sin, what it means is, it's not that he doesn't know it intellectually. It means that he has forgiven us our sins as if we'd never committed them because now he sees Christ, as Dylan previously said, he sees Christ if we've accepted his payment, if, he's, if, if we've accepted the ransom he's provided for us. So 
That's the amazing thing about Christianity. It's not just about having your sins forgiven. It's the fact that you're given the righteousness of Christ. So there's a lot of language used of God, which is metaphorical. This would be an example of it. Another would be that God, God's eyes go to and fro. Well, he doesn't have eyes. It's just a, an expressive way of saying that God sees all things. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. By the way, this is on YouTube, so you don't have to film it. You can just watch the YouTube thing. <laughs> Yes, sir. What's your name? Hi, my name is Josh. Josh, go ahead, sir. Uh, this is a little bit of a challenging question because it's caused division among Christians. Okay. So I don't know how you want to answer it. Sure. But um, <coughs> you mentioned the Big Bang. Josh, we're out of time. Sorry. Oh, uh, too, too long. Oh, okay. Take it easy. Sorry. I, All right. I'll, I'll just leave. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so uh, you mentioned the Big Bang. Yes. And the word day in the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in dialogue with people about uh, that issue and the age of the earth and this type of thing. Yeah. And, of course, Bill Nye, the science guy, came here. Uh -huh. And he debated Ken Ham at the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Yeah. Here in Dallas, we have the Institute for Creation Research, mm -hmm. which also argues for a, about a 6,000-year-old Earth. Right. Okay. So this word day, the, the, I, through the interviews I've done, what I've realized is the group of Christians in America who argue this say that if that word doesn't mean a 24-hour day, then the resurrection is not true and the book of Revelation is not true. It has to be one continuous thread. All right, good. All right, let me, let's, let's, let's launch okay. here on this because okay. this question comes up a lot. That's why it's the first slide in the Q&A. Um, how old is the universe? Okay, just give me a few minutes on this and uh, we'll uh, then come back to you here in just a second. Sure. If you're going to say the universe is old, then you have to make assumptions that you can't prove. For example... The light from the stars assumes the speed of light hasn't changed. Or you're making an assumption it hasn't changed. If the speed of light hasn't changed, the universe certainly appears to be 13.8 billion years old. Now, is it a good assumption that the speed of light hasn't changed? Yeah, it probably is. Why? Because if you change the speed of light, you've got to change all the other laws of physics with it. You say, well, God could have done that. Oh, yeah, you, he could have. But now, again, you're making an assumption you can't prove. If you're going to say salt in the ocean somehow shows the earth is young, you're assuming a deposition rate that is assumed to be unchanged, and you're also assuming the beginning amount of salt and minerals is assumed to be zero. If you're going to say that radioactive dating, which apparently is only good to about 50,000 years ago, gives us accurate information, you've got to assume the decay rate is assumed to be unchanged, and in uranium dating, the beginning amount of lead is assumed to be zero. In other words, there are always assumptions that you need to make to date anything. Personally, I'm absolutely certain, however, that the universe is at least 60 years old. <laughs> All right. I'm going to throw my mom in there. It's at least 84. Okay. Now, if you're going to say the earth is young, because many people will, uh, answers in Genesis and super creation research, as you say, you also have to make assumptions. Okay. First of all, if you notice, since the initial creation happened before day one, the Bible doesn't say how old the universe is. What does the first verse say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, when did God create the heavens and the earth? In the beginning. You say, what about the days? The days don't begin until verse 3. Now, Genesis 1-1 could be a summary statement of the, the next creation story there, or the, the expression of the creation story with the days. Or he could have said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the days are something else. How he did it, and it, is that later? We don't know. It's not told to us. Secondly, even if the days are pertinent to the age question, the word for day in Genesis 1 could mean longer periods of time. In fact, right here, Genesis 2-4, that word day does not mean 24 hours. It means the entire six-day creation period. In fact, day can have several different meanings. It can mean 24 hours, certainly. It could also mean 12 hours. Why? He called the... Uh, the light day and the darkness night. It could mean an era. Like if I were to say that uh, Tony Romo was a good quarterback in his day, you wouldn't think Tony Romo was only good for 24 hours, right? You would, well, maybe he was. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you would say for a period of time, right? And there's a fourth usage I'll get to in a minute. The third day seems to require longer than 24 hours because you have the growth of vegetation, including fruit-bearing plants. Look, even if you put miracle grow on that stuff, it doesn't grow that fast. You say, well, maybe God could have sped it up. Maybe he did, but now again, you're making assumptions you can't prove. Also, the sixth day seems to require longer than 24 hours, the naming of the animals. 
Adam starts naming the animals late in the sixth day. You know how many animals there were even in Adam's day? It would seem like it would take too long. In fact, Brad Stein, a Christian comedian, has a little bit on this. He says, when Adam first started naming the animals, he was real creative. Hippopotamus! Rhinoceros! By the end of the day, <sighs> cow. <laughs> Ox. You know, he's just run out of gas. And now, number five here, the seventh day is longer because it hasn't ended yet. Here's the fourth possible usage or meaning of the word day is the fact that the seventh day goes on right now. We're still in the seventh day. So if the seventh day is longer than 24 hours, the other days can be longer than 24 hours. We simply don't know. Look, the young earth interpretation biblically could be true. So could the old earth interpretation. But we have to bring all of our knowledge to the text, including knowledge we get from outside the Bible to interpret what the Bible means. I'm not talking about scientific data here. I'm talking about the fact that you need to know certain things are true and even to, uh, to understand Genesis. When in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You've got to know what a beginning means. You've got to know what heavens and the earth mean. You've got to know what God means. You've got to know cause and effect. You've got to have, you have all this before you ever get to the text. So I don't think anybody can make an airtight case that you have to interpret that passage in a certain way. And no matter which way you take it, you still need God. No matter how far back you go, you want to go back thousands of years or billions of years, you still need God. So for me, it's an intramural debate. And I guarantee you when you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, did you think it was old or young? Right? <laughs> That's not going to be the question. It's going to be, what did you do with Jesus? So science and the Bible are not at odds. There are some interpretations of the scientific and biblical data that might be at odds, but those are the interpretations. Remember, science doesn't say anything. Scientists say things. And you've got to look at the data to see what the proper interpretation is. I think the evidence is better it's old. But really, to be honest with you, I don't care how old it is. I don't have a dog in this fight. Okay, I just think the evidence is better it's old. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, What's your name? Uh, Jack. Jack, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you have read Harris's Moral Landscape all the way through. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I did too. And uh, I want you to know, like, I'm on your side. Uh -huh. um, I believe, like, God definitely authors uh, morality. But... Uh, I think in Stealing from God, mm -hmm. I think you may have, like, slightly neglected Harris's argument. Okay, go um, ahead. I think Sam makes a – I had to write this down. Um, I think Sam makes, made a pretty good point uh, about pain being correlated to uh, well-being. And, uh, like, again, I, I believe God authors morality, but uh, I think we shouldn't brush over the idea that Sam does establish kind of a baseline for morality and well-being. Uh, I think the metaphor he put was – if you can imagine a world where everyone experienced the most pain possible, we can at least all objectively agree that anything else but that would be better. Um, and because he has a baseline, even though it may get foggier down the road with where an atheistical sense of morality could be, even though it does get foggy, I think he does establish a paradigm there, and, and there's a plane, especially since he did have that baseline. Uh, for the question, basically, I want you to expound more than you did in Stealing from God, like, at least you can, like, in this well, amount of time. Well, I, I, I wonder if maybe we didn't explain ourselves clearly in there, Jack, because our point is not that we disagree with Sam Harris in his book, The Moral Landscape, that human flourishing is a good thing. We do agree with that. What we don't agree with is the foundation for that, because if there is no God, then why human flourishing? Why not dolphin flourishing? Yeah, I think um, what Sam or is... Or cowboy flourishing. I think, I think what Sam is mostly establishing is like, I think there's definitely like a metaphysical aspect to it, but when you get down to more or less like, especially like neurons and like the way the human body feels pain, I think he does have like somewhat of a case that at least physical pain on that paradigm holds weight for something of an objective morality. Again, like well, I... Well, but why, why is it wrong to inflict pain on people, according to him? I think because when you... What did you get enjoyment from it? Why is pain bad? Well, I think like that's a question that... I mean, I've heard your response to this question a couple times, mm -hmm. but I think 
that's definitely sort of how we would say the moral law is written on our heart, and again, I would concur with that. I think even from a secular standpoint, there's a base given uh, knowledge that physical Wait, okay, pain... Okay, hang, hang on, Jack, because we got a long line behind you. Yeah, I understand. I see what you're saying. This is not an epistemological problem. It's an ontological problem. It's not how we know what good and bad behavior is. It's, it's how do you define what good and bad behavior is in the absence of God? How do you discover what good is? Remember, if there's no purpose to the game, you can't say that, oh, this play will, is a better play than this other play. This behavior is a better behavior than another behavior if there's no purpose to life. Understood. And there is no purpose to life on, on Harris's atheistic, materialistic worldview. I concur. Yeah, right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jack. By the way, Jack, that's good you brought that up because that is the biggest, I think, a disconnect that atheists have on the moral argument. They always confuse epistemology and ontology. Epistemology is how you know something. Ontology is the study of the thing you know. Why does that thing exist to begin with? And I think that's what they always forget. Appreciate you. All right, thank you. Appreciate it, Jack. Yes, ma'am, what's your name? Hi, my name's Avery. Um, Say again? My name's Avery. Avery, go ahead. Um, so I have a question about hell. Uh, uh -huh. I don't remember which verse, but I know in the Bible it talks about flames and the gnashing of teeth. Um, how do we know which parts uh, of the verse of hell to take uh, literally and which parts are just imagery? Well, it's a good question. You'd have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. I think the descriptions in the Bible about hell are metaphorical to a certain extent. For example, on one hand it says hell is outer darkness, on the other hand it says fire. They seem to be contradictory physically because if you have fire you don't have darkness, right? <laughs> now some people are relieved to say, oh, it's just a metaphor. I wouldn't be so much relieved <laughs> because if they're using those kind of metaphors, it's a terrible place. But justice occurs in hell. Nobody's going to be at a level of torment than they deserve more than they deserve because God is infinitely just. There's nobody in the afterlife who's going to say, oh, God, I got a raw deal. You're really treating me unjustly here. No, by definition, God is just. So I think they use metaphors in hell to try to communicate destruction. They use metaphors in hell, the Bible does, to try and communicate uh, the idea that weeping and gnashing of teeth is the fact that the people in hell are set against God, that they are angry with God, and they're still sinning against God, which is one reason why hell goes on, because you don't stop sinning in hell. Uh, so I think it is metaphorical language, but that's to communicate something that's hard to communicate in plain language. I, where, where in the Bible does it say that, we continue to, that people continue to sin in hell? I think that's one, of the, that's one of the implications I'm drawing from it, weeping oh, okay. and gnashing of teeth, that they are they're continually, they're conscious and continually set against God. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Okay, and then one more thing. It's mm -hmm. really quick. Um, is it fair to, send, to like let someone go to hell who genuinely seeks for the truth, but they just for some reason don't arrive at Christianity? Uh, well, like that's a very question. Are there such people? That's the question. And I only, I don't even think, I think sometimes we self-deceive ourselves. Okay. I, I, I don't know how honest we are even with our own selves. At the end of the day, you don't go to hell because you haven't heard of Jesus. At the end of the day, you go to hell because you've sinned. Mm -hmm. Right? It would be like saying I died because I didn't go to the doctor. No, I died because I had a disease. Now, maybe I could have prevented dying by going to the doctor. But the reason I'm dying is because I have a disease, not because I haven't gone to the doctor. Now, Jesus wants people to be saved more than we do. God says, I want all people to be saved. But some people are not saved. Why? Because they don't want God. They want to go their own way. So what we do, because we know what does save them, is we risk all to get them the gospel, Avery. That's why we try and get them the gospel, and then we leave the results to God. We can't bring everyone to Christ. All we can do is bring Christ to everyone. Okay, thank you. Right, I, thank I really you. appreciate you coming here. All right, thank you, Avery. God bless you. You too. Yes, sir. Hi, Frank. Uh, hey. My name is Ashton, and I have a question about the virgin birth. Yes. So the uh, reason I'm bringing this up is I was reading Jung, and to summarize his idea um, who really are you, who briefly. Who are you reading? Carl Jung. Oh, uh, Carl Jung. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Carl Jung. Um, 
so to summarize his, his idea up really quick, um, the psyche is divided into a conscious sphere and an unconscious sphere. Mm -hmm. And in the unconscious sphere, that's where all these symbols emerge that we see in religions and mythology all over the world. Well, in, in one case, um, Jung tries to explain this dynamic, and he says that the, the conscious and the unconscious are, are virtually irreconcilable. And in order to reconcile with one another, the unconscious will produce a third thing in, in order to bring the two together. I guess a good analogy is my parents. <laughs> and so um, this third thing is puer atronis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's Latin. It means eternal child. And so it's the um, archetype of the child god. Um, and this symbol is very ubiquitous. We find it like off the top of my head. I, I know the, the tale of the bamboo cutter is a very common folklore tale in Japan. Uh, and in that story, a princess emerges from a flower. Um, and, uh, you know, the Buddha apparently, according to the, the Buddhist tradition, emerged from his mother's side. And, and the reason they, they have the, the child god emerges in such a bizarre manner is because he comes from the unconscious. He's this unknown thing. And so he has to emerge in a miraculous way or in an unempirical way. Okay, let me, um, let me just kind of jump in here because we've got a lot of people behind you. Are you trying, is, is Jung so, trying to say that Christianity is just another version of these mythical... Well, uh, what, I, what I'm saying is, is the, can we trust the, the narrative of the virgin birth or is it just an act of psychological projection, unconscious psychological projection on the part of the writer of Matthew? Okay, well... If someone is going to try and say that it is the unconscious uh, psyche of Matthew, as you just pointed out there, if I got that right, they would need to have evidence for that. Look, it's hard to evaluate people on a couch in front of you. To try and evaluate somebody you never met who lived 2,000 years ago who wrote a biography of Jesus and say, I know why he wrote this in this way, it seems like it's historical, but it's really something going on in his unconscious, I don't think we can establish that. All right? Uh, and I think what, and I say, I don't know if, an, enough about Jung to have a firm opinion on what you're saying here. You know more about it than I do. But I do know that many people have tried to make the argument that Christianity is just another myth like all these other myths. The problem with that is, is we have so much historical evidence. We've been, some of it we've been through here, which says otherwise. Secondly, just because there are commonalities between world religions doesn't mean one is borrowed from another. In fact, what brought C.S. Lewis to faith was the fact that his colleague, J.R.R. Tolkien, who, as you know, wrote Lord of the Rings, said to Lewis, See, uh, he said, uh, Jack, so that was his name, uh, they call him Jack, Jack, you know, you have always been enthralled with sacrificial heroes in myths Except in Christianity, why is that? And he basically told Lewis that Christianity is the true myth, meaning that this is the one that really happened, and there's evidence for it. And it dawned on Lewis that he was rejecting the Gospels when he wouldn't reject stories that were actually mythical. He thought that they were beautiful stories. He knew they weren't true, but when he looked at the Gospels, he wasn't enthralled by it until Tolkien pointed it out to him and said, no, this is the true myth. And then he investigated the evidence and came to that conclusion. This really happened. Does that make sense? Yeah, I follow. I mean, I think there's evidence for uh, the Gospels. And then, okay, I have one more question, uh -huh. if I can just sneak this in, um, about Mark and priority. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you mentioned earlier in the talk that everyone universally accepts that Mark was written first, but there's a number of problems that come with that, like the synoptic problem, like how did Luke and Matthew get their sources. Mm -hmm. If their source was Mark, clearly they would have to draw from Q, from L, and from like every other letter in the alphabet, <laughs> from all these other sources. But the patristic authors, the authors that came like right after Jesus, centuries fo uh, following, uh, affirm Matthean priority. And Matthew is also the book that comes in, in the beginning of the uh, New Testament, like every Bible. So uh, if you accept Matthean priority, it dispels the synoptic problem. Not only that, it, it dispels the evolutionary hypothesis that over time this narrative of Jesus evolved from what it was in Mark, a very basic uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. theology, into something incredibly advanced like in John. But if Matthew came first, which affirms that Jesus is the Son of God, it dispels all of those criticisms. So I, I was just wondering 
I don't, I don't have any problem with Matthew being first. I'm just telling you where the scholarship is, that the majority mm -hmm. side with Mark. I haven't studied this in depth myself, so there are other people I would rely on, like Mike Lacona, Dr. Mike Lacona, who's done a lot of research on this. He thinks there are better arguments that Mark is first, but Matthew could be first. Mm. All right? Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate Good. it. All right. Yep, thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, Frank. My name is Ken. Hey, Ken. First of all, thank you so much for coming over here. Got my boy and my wife and his wife, and we absolutely love you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, thank you. you but I do mom. have Beautiful. a question, and I want your opinion, because this is a dilemma that I have personally been going through. Uh-huh. And it's about the unity of a church. Yes. And the unity of the church when we can, and we're human, so we always, if, if, sin, if sin is going about, Right. We tend to overlook sin or color it up if we benefit from it. That's right, yeah. And I see this happening a lot lately in the churches. Uh huh. And what I'm stating is this. There's two men that I really admired that I really thought were incredible, mm -hmm. that I absolutely learned so much. Matter of fact, one brought me to learning from you, Ravi Zacharias mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Now, those two men that I absolutely loved had two sins mm -hmm. in their lives. Mm -hmm. Adultery. Yeah. And yet, what one, most Christians right now are staying away from Ravi Zacharias. They mm -hmm. would not, they were distancing mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. from one. But yet, on another level with Martin Luther King, oh, he's a great man. Mm -hmm. And I'm not looking at any color, I'm not looking at any. I'm looking at what's truth right. and what you presented today. Mm -hmm. I determine right or wrong, good and bad, based on what the Bible is mm -hmm. and what Jesus tells us. Mm -hmm. So when, when I go to church and I have kids that are now, because I bring them up in the way of the Lord, and we, li we listen to Ravi together, and now they see that we have labeled one man who did the exact sin and say, oh, he's a great man. Mm -hmm. And we look at this one and we shun him. What do you say to, not only to my children, but to Christians? Well, one of the things I think you say, and I did a whole hour on the Ravi Zacharias yes, I, uh, uh, yeah. uh, scandal last February. It's on our podcast. You can listen to it, so there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, maybe we do have a double standard uh, on certain things. Uh, maybe it was the freshness of what happened to Ravi. You know, Martin Luther King was, uh, you know, over 50 years ago. And people just tend to highlight the great things he did. Now, from a national perspective, obviously, Martin Luther King is a much more prominent figure than Ravi Zacharias. So many people were probably more apt to overlook the adultery with Martin Luther King than they were with Ravi Zacharias. So that may be part of it. But I think the whole Ravi Zacharias scandal show is more evidence that God exists. Why? Because nothing would be wrong with Ravi Zacharias committing adultery unless God existed. Right? Correct. We're, 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 we, we wouldn't judge him wrong unless we knew what right was. And right wouldn't exist unless God existed. So the whole Ravi Zacharias thing just shows we're all fallen. Any one of us are susceptible to sex, money, and power. That's why we need to put accountability around us and protections around us. Because any one of us are susceptible to it. So that should be a red flag for all of us. But... What Ravi said, most of the time what he said was spot on and true. That, ha that hasn't changed. Okay. And so you've got to set aside his personal problems from the truth that he preached. Look, so, if, so we can use of course the can. information because I said, you know, God's yeah. word doesn't come back void. Yeah. So I, I do understand that he can turn bad things to good. Right. And, and, and that dilemma, and we have an outreach that we reach out to the homeless, to the food insecure. Mm -hmm. And we're just starting out. We're just a baby outreach. And that principle is what I'm, 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 I'm really trying to grasp here. You sure. know, it's, it's the question that we have is if, if a drug dealer gives, wants to donate 100000 do we receive that? Knowing that he is a drug dealer, knowing that he is giving us money that he gained uh -huh. from immoral means, mm -hmm. do, we, do we say, yeah, give us the money? Mm -hmm. And that's the dilemma that we're in. Yeah, and, that's and something you're going to have to take up with your board, <laughs> quite yeah, obviously. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, we're, st we're still small. We don't have a board. Okay, yet. all right. But, but that's what, those are the questions right. that we have. And it, why can't we all be, as Christians, if we're all using God as our standard, why can't we all just, why couldn't we give an answer and be a blanket answer? 
Why is it? Well, you got to look at this, and we got to we got to find well, this. Well, can remember the reason is is because human beings disagree on almost everything at at some level because we're fallen creatures in a fallen world, and we have all sorts of other motivations that might cause us to suppress the truth to go our own way. There you go. Thank you Thank so you. much, appreciate Frank. I appreciate it. it. All right. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hey, uh, my name is Hermon. Uh, nice Hermon, to meet you. Uh, so my first question is pretty quick. Uh, you mentioned the means by which the Nazis were uh, tried. Uh, they, there was a moral standard above their government yeah. uh, for them to that they, that they did not abide by. Um, do you have a direct quote for that? I've tried to look into like the Nuremberg trial transcripts. Um, one, the Cl uh, Cliff, ne I, I, forget his, I forgot his last name. Yeah. Um, he mentioned Robert Jackson, one Robert of the judges. Robert Jackson was, I think, the attorney, one of the attorneys at the Nuremberg trials. Yeah. And he may have, you may try and go back and read the transcript of the Nuremberg trials, but yeah. the only way that one government could judge another government because the Nazi soldiers are saying, hey, we're just following our government. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't uh, blame us. We had an authority we were obeying. The only way we could convict them is to say, you had a moral obligation to disobey an immoral order from your government because there's a standard beyond your government, and that standard has been called many different things. It's called international law. C.S. Lewis called it the moral law. Thomas Jefferson called it nature's law. The Apostle Paul called it the law written on the heart from God. It's God's nature put, it on, our, put on our hearts. So that's our ultimate authority, not governments. Right. And I was just curious if you, if you had a, like, a quote. Well, I, don't, I don't have any quote that okay. I can that's verbatim fine. quote, but that's no the way we were able to try them right, because right. we appealed to uh, a government beyond theirs or a standard beyond theirs, right. and that would be God's nature. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, but my second question yeah. is uh, how do you balance uh, God's sovereignty with the free will of man? Uh, we're not predestined to talk about that here mm -hmm. tonight. <laughs> I don't think it's a balance at all. Why? Because people think that since God knows what we're going to do, that we don't have free will. But that's not, that doesn't follow. I'll give you an example. Suppose a, a, a new mother puts her infant baby down to sleep one night. Well, she knows at some point during the night that baby's going to wake up and want to eat, right? But because she knows that, does that mean she's causing the baby to wake up? No. Yeah. Knowledge does not imply causation. When God elects to create this universe, he knows the outcome. Why? Because he's outside of time. In any universe he creates, he knows the outcome. But that doesn't mean he's forcing us to do what we do. He knows what we're going to do freely. Look, God is so sovereign that he can get his will done through our free will. <laughs> and if we don't have free will, then the whole universe is a sham. Yeah. And God... There's no morality because we're just, robots. we don't have free will. We're yep. just programmed to do what we do. We're, we're nothing but moist robots. Yep. This is the same problem the atheists have when it comes to materialism. And I think the hard five-point Calvinism view suffers from the same problem. We're just moist robots mm -hmm. unless we have free will. Awesome. Thank you for your answer. Appreciate it. All right. Thank it. you. Thank you. Hello there. Yes, sir. What's your name? I'm JT. JT, go ahead. Um, so I've, I'm a Christian, obviously, and or not obviously, but um, so I've been kind of struggling with just a little kind of dilemma that I keep running in my head. Uh huh. Um, so if God, I, I think you kind of answered like a little bit, and I don't know if you're allowed to because this has a little bit to do with predestination. Uh huh. But if we are if God is just, yes, an all-just God, and w he knows that there are people out there that are not saved, and he does, doesn't do anything about it, and they go to hell, um, what does that ultimately say about God's nature? God of, knows all counterfactuals. He knows how people are going to react in any situation. And right. he wants people to be saved more than we do. Yeah. So if people ultimately do not accept Christ, it's not God's fault. They don't want to accept Christ. And even if he had gotten them the gospel, they wouldn't have accepted it. God 
freely, or God allows people to have free will to make moral choices. So, so would you say he doesn't have power over um, his creation? Then? No, he does, but it would be a contradiction to say that God forces free people to do what they want to do. That would be a contradiction, right? Yeah. God can do anything that's logically possible, but God can't do logically impossible things. He can't force free creatures to do what he wants because then they wouldn't be free. He can't create a square circle. He can't create a one-ended stick. He can't create an honest politician. I mean, there, there are some things that God can't do because they're contradictory. Well, then wouldn't that mean he's not all-powerful? No, power means he, has every, he can do everything that's logically possible. Not everything that we could imagine. Like I said, he can't create a square circle. That thing doesn't exist. It's, a, it's an absurdity. Well, all right? Wouldn't a virgin birth also be illogical? No, it's nothing well? illogical. We could have all been born through a virgin birth. Or healing people with touches or like yeah. miracles. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I hear a lot of chatter. Um, I'm having trouble hearing him. Or um, turning water into wine. That's pretty illogical it too. It has nothing to do with logic. How is it illogical to turn water into wine? It's never happened before. Oh, it happens all or, the time. I mean, it happened in the Bible, of course. Yeah, it happens all the time. Water goes into the ground, goes up in the grapevine, turns, it, it helps a grape grow, and that ultimately turns into wine. All Jesus did was speed it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, if the, if the God who created the universe wants to intervene in the universe and overpower a natural law, can he do that? I'm sorry. Of course he can, right? Just like, you know, we can overpower natural laws. Look, I'm overpowering a natural law right now. Gravity, right? Yeah. I'm an, I'm an agent that can intervene and overpower natural laws. Now, true, if, if, if I decide not to intervene anymore, natural laws take over. But if I can intervene and overpower natural law, can the being who created and sustains natural laws do so? Yeah, of course. That's all we're saying. And he does that in order to, to show people you need to, you need to listen to this guy. Like that's why Moses can do miracles and Jesus can do miracles because God has new revelation that he's pouring out through those people. So the rest of the people go, oh, Moses can do miracles? Moses speaks for God. Jesus can do miracles? Jesus speaks for God. That's why God does miracles through those people. Okay. Um, well, that, puts, that still puts him in this box that he created for himself, I feel like. God is not in a box he created for himself. God's nature is such that he can do things that don't contradict his nature. Like, God can't go out of existence. God can't sin. We can sin. We can do things God can't do. We can sin. He can't. If he could sin, he wouldn't be the standard of righteousness. Right, because he's so, all just. Yeah, so power doesn't imply he can do anything, even logically impossible things or things against his nature. He can do whatever is logically possible, but even... An all-powerful God can't force free creatures to do what he wants them to do because then, by definition, they wouldn't be free. Okay, so you would s say that um, there's, it's a little bit more free will than, like, he kind of planned all of this. So no, both. It's both. Oh, it's both. Yeah. Okay. He knew what we would do, and when he elected this universe, he knew the outcome, but... The outcome isn't dependent completely on his choice. It's also dependent on our choice, okay. what we freely chose. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Yes. Um, hello. I'm kind hey, of... Hey, what's your name? My name is Henry. Henry, go ahead, sir. So I just have a couple of questions. So uh -huh. first of all, how would you respond to someone who says, are you supposed to hear something back when you pray? Uh, I would say, where in the scriptures does it say you're going to hear something back? Okay. Okay, I would ask them, why, why do they think you're going to hear something back? Something may happen, like a prayer might be answered, and I don't deny that if God wanted to talk to you directly, he could. It's never happened to me. Well, actually, it has, and the voice sounds a lot like my wife. But um, <laughs> it's never happened to me that I had an audible voice because I think God communicates most of the time through his word and sometimes through other people. Mm -hmm. But the will of God is never contrary to the word of God. Any... Any kind of idea we get or any kind of advice we get from other people, if it contradicts the word of God, it's not the will of God. I see. All right. And then um, my next question is, how would you respond to someone who says, if God is all-knowing, why are there so many denominations? 
Uh, because for a number of reasons, we have an entire podcast on this, why are there so many denominations? But as I said earlier, people tend to disagree on the peripheral issues. In the denominations that agree that the Bible's true, the de different denominations disagree on what we call secondary or tertiary issues. They all agree that there is a God, you are not him, you're a sinner, you need to be saved, Jesus came to save us, he is God, he died and rose again and will one day come again and by trusting in him you can have your sins forgiven. They all agree on that. They may disagree on mode of baptism, they may disagree on end times, eschatology, they may disagree on the color of the carpet, they may disagree on uh, liturgy or a more free-flowing service. They may disagree on these secondary issues, but they still agree on the core. And I actually think some difference in denomination is good. Why? Because some people worship better in a liturgical service. Other people worship better in a more free-flowing free service, non-liturgical. So some of these denominations are good. God can express himself in different denominations as, as long as the people in the denominations believe the Bible is the word of God. Okay, thank you. That's all. All right, thank you. Good questions, Henry. And check out that podcast on denominations. There's a lot more in there. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, Jamarcus. Hey, Jamarcus. Sorry, we got to keep. I, uh, I was going to have a, uh, a race question, but my friend told me not to. So, so There's only okay. one race, the human race, but go ahead. So, um, so I have a, a question about Jesus. You believe him to be factually correct? Like, uh, like he existed, he uh -huh. was uh, a life form on this planet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that would also mean that, if you, that would mean the New Testament is completely true, like, right? The New Testament doesn't have to be completely true mm -hmm. to know the essentials of Christianity. Okay. I do think it is completely true, but okay. it doesn't have to be. Okay, uh, so my thing is, is that that would also make uh, the Old Testament completely true. Uh, Jesus says himself that uh, the Old Testament is basically like unbroken word. Yes, so and I think that's a good argument to take the Old Testament as the word of God because Jesus thought it was the word of God. Right. And it's never a good idea to disagree with Jesus. Right, yeah. So you have, uh, so you have accounts of historical, let's say historical in the Old Testament terms, mm -hmm. uh, that you have a, a, a superhuman... Um, uh, male Samson uh, basically uh, had brute strength, uh, mm -hmm. lifted objects. You had Moses, uh, part of the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Noah that built an ark that mm -hmm. uh, carried animals across the uh, mm -hmm. ocean while God floods the earth. And then you also have uh, my p Nick picking is Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. uh, basically. So you're saying that's all factually correct in a way. Why? Um, how do we build a healthy society off of incest? Off of what? Incest. I'm talking about like, so Adam and Eve have children. Okay, they have so children, the question is where did really Cain get his wife? Kind of. <laughs> right, like, yeah, they're basically like all sleeping with each well, other. Well, I as think family. it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty obvious. He got it at christiantingle.com. <laughs> oh, well, I Where else do you get a wife? <laughs> no, right. and when, first of all, the Bible traces one bloodline. It doesn't mm -hmm. trace every person that ever existed. It couldn't right? Mm -hmm. it, it's got to limit itself to one bloodline, the Messiah's bloodline. When it just out of the blue says Cain took a wife, there could have been hundreds or thousands of people on the earth by then. Mm -hmm. um, it's not covering everybody that's been born. Secondly, it's, mm -hmm. incest is not a problem at the beginning of the genetic, uh, at the beginning of the genetic uh, line. I don't because know. I think, uh, I think like if you look at like uh, kings and, uh, you know, like Britain, stuff like that. There's tons of apparent incest. And no, 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 I'm saying the, 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 the genetic code was pure. And the reason incest is not permissible now is because it has a greater potentiality to yield deformities in the offspring. At the time of Adam and Eve and the immediate ancestors after that, there was none mm -hmm. of that. There was no genetic problem. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just can't wrap my head around that. Like, it's saying it's the perfect... DNA, but I mean, that's, that's your case, but uh, to say it's like the perfect DNA, it, uh, like even they say like God didn't make Adam and Eve perfect, it was, it was his like nice creation, but not like supremely perfect to where it would have like healthy offspring from, you know. They were in a state of innocence and then they fell 
And then that's when so DNA God corrupted. immediately okay. came in and said, okay, I'm going to bring an offspring. The offspring of Eve is going to crush the head of the offspring of Satan, the serpent. Right. And, and so that's the first prophecy in the Old Testament. So DNA got corrupted by an apple. DNA got corrupted by a choice. Mm -hmm. Whether it was a literal apple or not, Christian theologians are going to talk about that. Is that a mm -hmm. metaphor for something else? Or is a literal tree and a literal apple? The real issue here is is that Adam and Eve were given a choice no, to either wait, obey God or not obey God wait. and thankfully God gave them that ability so they wouldn't be robots see, see that's they had a moral capacity uh, to make a choice yeah uh, so you we're we're literally making it literal like uh, I mean like if it's a literal apple then that's something that was physically taken from a tree and eaten basically okay why why would that be a problem if it was I'm, I'm not saying that would be a okay. problem. I'm just saying, like, illogically, like, in the grand scheme of things, that would cause a whole, like, wave of sin. Like, yeah, it is the apple, like, the no, special no, 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 no. apple. The, the apple like if, isn't the issue. It's the choice to take the apple that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay? It was, it, was the, it was the desire to disobey God and, okay. and, the, and the actual action to disobey God. God gave them the ability to follow him or go their own way and they choose to go their own way and God being a loving God said okay it's a moral universe now I'm going to intervene in order to save you and I'll save you if you want to be saved but I'll leave you alone if you don't mm -hmm. and that's what hell is Jamarcus did I get that right yes sir if Christianity were true would you become a Christian I already am Christian I'll just I just like to ask questions oh okay all right good yeah. <laughs> all right thanks Hello. My yes, sir. What's your name? My name's Spencer. Spencer, my second son. Spencer. Yeah. Good name. Uh, so I have a question about uh, free will because there's at least two times in the Old Testament that I'm kind of like I'm just kind of confused about. Okay. And the first time was with Pharaoh, where when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay. And then the second one is in like First Kings 22. Uh, where it's like where they're like about to go to war and they're talking about prophets and it says now therefore behold the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets and the Lord has declared disaster for you okay so I'm just, like I'm just a little confused about because is God kind of making that choice for them and forcing them to yeah good question let's deal with that? Pharaoh first okay God hardened Pharaoh's heart now who hardened his heart first Pharaoh or or God. Pharaoh did, right? What God did is he completed the process. And Paul actually talks about this in Romans 1, that if you suppress the truth long enough, God is going to give you up to your own desires to go your own way. Now, when God hard, uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart, if you go to Romans 9, this is not a passage about whether or not Pharaoh's going to heaven. This yeah. is a passage about how God used Pharaoh for his purposes here on earth. And the, the language of hardening shows that Moses knew the culture of Egypt. Why? Because for a pharaoh to make the afterlife, once he was interred in his pyramid or wherever he was buried, his heart was supposedly put on a scale. And if his heart weighed more than a feather, he wouldn't make it to the afterlife and he would be consumed by this creature that would eat his heart. If his heart was light, meaning he hadn't sinned, and the feather was heavier than the heart, he would be permitted to go to the afterlife. What Moses is saying is, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh sinned against God and wouldn't relent, wouldn't do what God said, that Pharaoh is a sinner and his heart is going to be hardened, which means it's going to be heavy, and which means it's, it's going to be heavier than a feather, and he's going to be judged in the afterlife. He's not going to make it to the afterlife. That's why it used the phrase hardening. And if you go further, if you look at the, at the plagues against Egypt, all of those plagues, or at least most of those plagues, are slams on the Egyptian gods. They're not random plagues. You know, yeah. you worship the Nile, we're turning the Nile to blood. You worship the sun, we're going to blot it out. You worship Pharaoh, we're going to kill the firstborn. You like frogs, I'll give you frogs, right? This, these are all slams against the Egyptian gods, which shows you Moses knew. Moses was there. Moses knew the Egyptian culture. Okay. All right. Now, uh, this, the second one, I don't know the context of that one. I have to look that one up. Yeah, the second one was a lot more confusing for okay. me. Okay. Um, because, like, 
it shows that a spirit actually sh shows up and talks to them and says, I'm going to go do, put a lying spirit into their mouths. Okay, um, but the question is, who did that first? Mm -hmm. it, it, because God will complete a process that somebody begins. He will give them up to their own desires. I'd have to look at that passage okay. to speak on it more clearly, but I want you to get a book. If you would, Spencer, mm -hmm. it's a book written by my co-author. It's called The Big Book of Bible Difficulties, and I'm pretty sure that passage is in there. Okay. It's by Norman Geisler and Thomas Howe, so check that out. Okay, and then right. just it's in 1 Kings 22, just for anyone who wants to look that okay. up. Okay, so. all right, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Hey, Frank, how you doing? My name is Christian, uh, here with my wife. We're actually uh, in two weeks going to have our first son. Oh, so, beautiful. Uh, All right. Yeah. What's his name? Do you have a name yet? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. All yeah. right. Beautiful. Hey, Amen. Um, so, Frank, I got a couple questions. Uh, me and my wife, we've been walking with Christ for about three years now. And, um, you know, as a street preacher, especially preaching the gospel, majority, probably half the United States, I've met a lot of people, and there's a lot of divisions in the body of Christ. Uh -huh. And I have two questions for you. Okay. Um, one would be um, the oneness and Trinitarian view. Um, I mainly view myself as a Trinitarian yeah. because I believe in John chapter 17, right. Jesus was speaking to his father. That's right. If Jesus was the father, then he would be schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, do you believe that you've studied enough proof that the Trinitarian, is, the Trinity is true and oneness is wrong? Yeah, well, one of the problems with oneness, if oneness is true, that means when Jesus died, heaven was empty. Right. Right? That that's obviously can't be the case. I think there are several other arguments for the Trinity. You mentioned one of them. In fact, if you look in, in John chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word so was God, right. and the Word became flesh. Right. Right? Uh, and there are, at Jesus' baptism, what do you have? You've got the Father, the Son, and the, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit all at the same scene. Right. Okay, so yes, God is triune. Right. The thing that people get confused about with regard to the Trinity is a lot of people don't realize that Jesus had two natures, and that leads, uh, if you don't know that, it leads to a lot of confusion. So there's no perfect illustration of the Trinity, but let's just... Uh, use this triangle and a circle here, which I think is pretty good. Think of God as one divine nature, just like a triangle is one triangle, but each corner ha has, you know, there's a different corner. There's three triangle or three corners in a triangle. In one tr uh, corner, think of the Father, in another corner, the Son, in another corner, the Holy Spirit. They all share in the divine nature, right. but there are three persons in one divine nature. But in the Son, in Jesus, he also has a human nature that does not intermingle with the divine nature. And Paul talks about it in Philippians 2, that God has given up the privileges of his divinity in order to come to earth and live as a human being here on earth, even though the Father still exists, still has a divine nature, the Holy Spirit has the divine nature, the Son does too, but while he's on earth, he doesn't access the divine nature, he is a human being, and he grows in knowledge, according to Luke 2, 52, right? He right. learns more. So people will say, well, how could Jesus be God if he didn't know when he was coming back? Because Jesus has two natures, so whenever you ask a question about Jesus, you have to ask two questions. Did Jesus know when he was coming back as man? No. As God, yes. Did Jesus get hungry? As God, no. As man, yes. Right. So that really helps trying to get through some of these questions. You can also look at the Trinity this way. That God is one what with three who's. So there's one divine nature, but three persons in the divine nature. One what, three who's, but who too has two what's. He has a what one and a what two. So whenever you're asking a question about who two, you've got to say, which what are you talking about? Are you talking about what one or what two in who two? This is kind of the Abbott and Costello theology here, you know? All right. So I think when you look at it like this, you can conceptualize how you can have different answers or solve some of these problems when people ask you about how could God be uh, know all things and not know when he was coming back or those kinds of issues. Right. right. And, um, you know, that, that question I asked for those people who are watching that uh -huh. may believe in oneness. Now I have another question. Yep. Um, 
Another thing that divides the body of Christ is um, those who believe that you can lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. um, I've met a lot of people who, mm -hmm. you know, claim, you know, full of hallelujahs and amens, and then they never show up to church ever again. Right. And um, they just turn into atheists or they just don't ever want to talk about God. Um, and that's because many ministers teach that you could lose your salvation. Now, one question I have for you um, is that when the Bible claims, when Jesus says, I'd rather you hot or cold, lukewarm, I'll spew you from my mouth. What is your interpretation on that? Well, that's in Revelation chapter 3. Right. And that's really a play on what was going on in Laodicea. I think that was the church he was talking about where you had hot springs and cold springs coming in. And when they came into that area, the water was lukewarm, which wasn't good for bathing or drinking. So I spit you out of my mouth. God doesn't want you cold. He's just saying, if you're going to be a believer, you ought to be hot, right? You ought to be someone who's following me, just like the church ought to have been following him. Now, I think the better evidence is that you don't lose your salvation. If you said you were a believer and now you're denying you were a believer, you probably never were. You weren't sealed with the Holy Spirit. Right. But according to John chapter 5, when Jesus is talking uh, about this, he says, He who believes is passed from death into life. You don't get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life when you believe. And if it's eternal, can you lose it? No. No. So I think you have eternal life. And I think if you look at Romans 8, that's, it's pretty, you're, you're secure. The only thing you can't lose in this life is God. Right. All right? All right. And I remember you mentioned that because, uh, you know, um, when you go into the word, um, when Jesus adopts us, that word adopt, it's, uh, it's stronger than, uh, I think it was, um, I forget where it was from, but uh, if you look into adoption, it's, it's deeper um, than actually, uh, you know, when you're adopted, it's like you can't be returned. No, you can't be returned, and you're an heir to the throne. Right. You're, a, you're an heir to the inheritance, so to speak. Right. Thanks for your question, man. Thank I've got you very a few much, more Frank. behind you. God, God bless you. you, and thanks for street preaching. Hello. So I was taught um, young that— Give me your name again. I'm Annabelle. Yeah, yeah, Annabelle. Go ahead. Okay, so that Jesus um, died on the cross, and he went into— Hey, wait, you guys are leaving? You can't stay for six hours? What's wrong? <laughs> anyway, go, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> that he went into hell for three days, right? And uh -huh. I was recently introduced to the idea that when he went into hell, he brought back to heaven the people that were in hell who, like— who hadn't learned about, I mean, obviously, you know, Jesus hadn't been resurrected yet. So I guess my question is, is that sound theology and could it, um, and if not, how did the people before Jesus, you know, enter heaven? And then if it is uh, sound theology that the people, you know, brought from hell into heaven when Jesus was down there, could that mean that, uh, could that be an answer to what about people who never learned about Jesus? Could they go to hell and then go to heaven? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. No, I, I hadn't heard that when Jesus went to hell, he preached to the people. And this is from First Peter mm -hmm. 3. I hadn't heard that he brought him to heaven. I haven't heard okay. that. If someone were to say that, I would ask them, uh, what evidence do you have for that position? Look, when somebody says something, it's not your job to refute what they say. It's their job to support what they say. So if they're coming up with that sort of theology, I'd say, what scriptures are, are you pointing to for you to come to this conclusion? So I would ask them. You don't have to refute it. They have to support it, okay? But no, I haven't heard. That doesn't seem to make sense to me. In fact, if you look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, he says there's a great gulf fix between Hades and Abraham's bosom. And the guy, the rich man in hell, is not saying, get me out of here. He's just treating Lazarus like he's still his servant. Come put water on my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. He's not saying, I shouldn't be down here. He says, oh, go tell my brothers about mm -hmm. this. And Jesus says, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not even going to believe if somebody rises from the dead. Okay. And guess what? They didn't. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Annabelle. James. Yes. Go ahead, sir. So, um, A, you nailed it at Cottonwood Sunday. Oh, thank you. Cottonwood, Cottonwood Creek Church, yes. great church in Allen, by the way. Yeah. Just spoke there. Yeah. The Pastor John Mark there is very apologetically astute. So if you like this kind of thing, you may want to check out Cottonwood Creek Church. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually impressed me. you remember my name because we just met Sunday. Well, that's all right. Go ahead, so. man. Uh, and I don't know if you remember, but my question I didn't have when I came in. Yeah. You did it again tonight. All right. All right. So, um, you know, I studied the website, studied material. The CRT was money. 
that you did. Uh, but you did. My question actually comes from a talk you did with Bill Federer. Yeah. Uh, the origin of St. Nick. Right. Marvelous, right? Yeah. Well, that's Bill Federer. By the way, Bill yeah. Federer is brilliant. Yeah. You ought to look him up, AmericanMinute.com. Yeah, American I'm subscribed. Minute. You'll get one email a day on history, and you'll be blown away. You'll be going, how does this guy know all this stuff? Yeah. Well, I was hoping y'all would get to this, but y'all didn't. Um, the, the question is simply, can you tell us when June and July were added to the year? And the reason I say that is because – um, That's a Bill Federer question. Bill I Federer? have no idea. Yeah. Okay. But I'm glad they did because I like summer. Right. Well, okay. you know why I'm asking that, right? <laughs> no, why? Well, because. But you mean Jewel, like you mean from Julius Caesar? That's where we get right. July from? Right. And I mean. And June comes from June Carter Cash, right? Right. Well, it's, it's, it's logical that Jesus was. I know why we celebrate 1225, but it's logical that he was actually born in what we now call October because. If well, you take- actually, James, if you, if you listen real closely to what Bill was saying on that podcast, he says that doing the dating properly, December 25th is approximately when Jesus was born. Nice. Yeah, that's right. exactly right. You have to go. I can't remember the exact argument he had, yeah. but if you go back to our podcast from Christmas with Bill Federer, he explains the dating, how they came up with yeah. the dating. Yeah, cause it, it dawned on me when he said something, when he's uh, like, take octagon, that means eight sides. Uh-huh. Octopus have eight legs. Yeah. So October would be the eighth month. Huh. Novus is nine, and then Deca is a decade. Oh, decimal. interesting. So December would have been the tenth month. Uh huh. So I'm like, hmm. So I'm just, so Bill Federer. Bill Federer, look him up. Okay, because yeah, I want to know when June and July were put in. That was, that, All yeah. right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, James. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Uh, my name is Jonathan. Hey, I was curious. Uh, you mentioned some of the reasons the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh-huh. are true, but uh, I don't believe I've ever heard a good argument for why the letters, particularly Paul's letters, are true and accurate. Yes. Uh, well, actually, people are more certain about when Paul wrote his letters than they are about when the Gospels were written, and they're more certain that Paul is the author than they are certain about the Gospels were written. But Paul is uh, obviously interpreting much of what happened in the Gospels and the fact that Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the reason Jesus came. And Paul just unpacks that mostly in the book of Romans and also in the book of Galatians. And the other books that Paul is writing, well, most of the books Paul is writing, he's writing to churches, as you know, unless he's writing to people like Titus and Timothy and those kind of things. And he's writing, okay, now that Jesus has risen from the dead, now that we know what Christianity is all about, uh, let me flesh out the theology and let's make sure we live the right way. Word for word, uh, the, the epistles, the letters, 13 of which Paul wrote, are the most applicable portion of the Bible to believers because they cover everything that's happened to that point and they're more interpreting what's happened with regard to Christianity. We believe that Paul is telling the truth because we think Paul had a spiritual experience, a supernatural experience on the road to Damascus that turned him around completely from being a persecutor of the church to someone who is someone uh, promoting Christianity to his own detriment personally. And we also think he was able to do miracles as an apostle, which confirmed that he was speaking for God. And Luke, who is an accurate historian, records many of these miracles because, as you know, the story that is uh, the history of the church in the book of Acts from about 30 A.D. to about 62 A.D., that history parallels the times when Paul and other writers are writing their letters. So, for example... Uh, The book of Galatians is written probably around 48, 49 A.D., right after Paul took his first missionary journey uh, when he went to Lystra and Derbe and some of these other towns in a a country we now call Turkey. So if you read Acts chapter 13 and 14 and then read the book of Galatians, that's about the timeline you're reading. So what's going on historically in Acts, you're getting in the letters that Paul is writing. Thank you. All right, good question. Thank you. Oh, by the way, one other thing about that, Jonathan. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what Paul writes is nonsense, right? Uh, hi, my name's Andrew. In fact, Paul even says that, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. My name's Andrew. Andrew. Um, and, you know, we've been considering free will tonight uh, for uh -huh. a couple of these questions. And, uh, you know, I fully agree with what Scripture teaches uh, that, you know, God has given man a choice. And one of the things, uh, you, you know, you and other apologists will say is that if, if we don't have free will, then uh, true love can't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Love requires a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would agree with that. So, uh, but my question would be, uh, where, where does God fit in with that? Because we read in Scripture that God is love. Not, not only that he's loving and that he shows himself as loving, but that by his nature he's love. So I'm just curious, uh, does God have a choice when he loves us, or is he sort of bound by his nature to love us? Well, actually, love is bound up in the Trinity. That's another reason I believe in the Trinity, because mm -hmm. without the Trinity, you wouldn't have love. If you just have a purely monotheistic being and yep. no one to love, how do you have love? Mm -hmm. But in the Trinity, you have a lover, a loved one, and a spirit of love. God had perfect unity in the Trinity prior to creating. He didn't have to create. Mm -hmm. Some preachers have said, oh, God created because he was lonely. No, he wasn't. He created as a loving being to share his love with other creatures, and mm -hmm. so he did. Okay. So love flows naturally from God, mm -hmm. uh, and it is part of his nature. He is, um, I don't know if you could say bound to love. I guess you could say that, but he's also bound to be just in mm -hmm. the sense that since he is the standard of justice, he can't be unjust. And that's the very reason Jesus is the only way. It's not an arbitrary claim. Mm -hmm. It's not that Jesus just said, I'm the only way because I said so. Yeah. He's the only way because there's no other way to, to justify guilty sinners unless justice is satisfied. Mm -hmm. And the only way he can satisfy that justice is to punish an innocent substitute in our place. Otherwise, he's got to punish us, and he doesn't want to because he loves us. Right. So as, as Paul says in Romans chapter 3, that God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Yeah. In other words, God remains just, and he justifies sinners because he can do that since Jesus has taken our sins upon himself or our punishment upon himself. Thank you. I just one one more quick yeah. question. This was something that uh, someone asked uh, Brother John Lennox, and I, I was just curious about your answer. Whatever uh, Lennox says is better than mine. Yeah, well, well the, so the question was, uh, when you get to glory, what will be the first thing you say to our Lord Jesus? What would be the first thing? Yeah. Oh, gee, I don't know. I Let probably it, won't be saying anything. Yeah. I'll probably just be basking in the glory, so to speak. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of us are going to say, I'm going to ask God about what, I, yeah. I think we're going to be pretty quiet. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. We're not going to say, and what about, yeah, we're going to get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right? All right. So thank that's you. a good question. What did Lennox say? He said, uh, I drop on my face and say thank you. Yeah. Gratitude. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, I might ask him, why didn't you have Noah step on those two mosquitoes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. right? Wouldn't you? I'd ask that, mm -hmm. you know. Scorpions, why? Yeah. yeah. You know. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Right, yes, Frank. sir. Uh, my name is James. I had a question more soteriologically okay. based. Um, since there is a belief that doesn't manifest itself in salvation, Matthew 7, how uh, you mentioned the James 2 passage, and also in Luke 6, can you define the difference between saving faith versus a mere intellectual assent and bridging what the difference is between belief that and belief in and what belief in actually entails? Well, belief that is, let's use another analogy. Um, belief that is knowing that air travel is safe. Belief in is actually getting on the plane. And there are people who, although they know air travel is safe, psychologically can't get on a plane, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's why I tell people when they say, uh, so sometimes Christ, uh, former Christians, so-called former Christians say, you know, Frank, I was a Christian and I lost my faith. And I'm an atheist now. And a lot of times I want to say to them, so? So are you telling me because your psychology changed that God has somehow popped out of existence? You know, your psychology will not tell you whether something's true or not. The evidence will. Don't concentrate on your psychology. Concentrate on the evidence. Yeah, you could be scared to death to fly. But... The evidence says it's safe. Mm -hmm. So rely on the evidence to go from belief that to belief in. You've got to make a choice to do so because God is not going to force you into heaven against your will. If you don't want him, you don't have to go from belief that to belief in. Paul famously says everyone knows that there's a creator. 
but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness to go their own way. And there's a point, if you suppress the truth long enough and you get to the end of Romans chapter 1, I think those people no longer have the knowledge of God because God has given them up to their own desires. God leaves them alone. Mm -hmm. So belief that is just intellectual assent. Belief in is the will saying, yes, I want this. In fact, you could know that a particular woman could be a great wife for you. You could know that intellectually, but she's right. never going to become your wife until you go from belief that to belief in, right? You just didn't want him to say, you know, I believe you'd make a great wife, right? You wanted him to say, would you be my wife, right? So that's the difference, mm -hmm. belief that to belief in. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, it's Jack again. again. Yeah, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Um, I guess my question is um, more around like Bill Craig and yeah. what he's been peddling like a lot lately. Yeah. I think he's been an amazing uh, voice, but uh, I was curious if you could give your opinion on if his idea, first off, of Genesis 1 through 11 as mytho history, mm -hmm. I, I, I more or less just want what you truly feel on it, but then I guess like to follow up, do you think that Christians or you know followers of Christ today should stop regarding uh, a lot of these issues about evolution and, and old earth? Should we stop putting those aside and start coming clean with what we can know based on um, science and archaeology? That way we can move more forward as a progressive society. And like maybe the denial or the pushing aside of a lot of the scientific evidence for evolution or uh, an older earth is actually probably hindering us in a way. And um, there's less people in here, so I felt safer to ask Well, you got, you got a lot of questions yeah. in here, but let me just say yeah. this. I have so much respect for Bill Craig yeah. that I'm not going to comment on what he's written because I haven't read it yet. Okay. okay? That's fair. And I, don't, I wouldn't want somebody commenting on my book uh, that it, they haven't read yet. Okay? Mm -hmm. I will say that I've listened to a lot of his podcasts about yeah. it, and personally, without reading it, some of the things he said I'm a little wary of. Okay, like the mytho history genre. I, I don't know how to define that, but again, I haven't read his book yet. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because he's a brilliant man. Do you plan uh, to read it? Uh, I might get to it eventually, but it's not on my uh, front of my front burner list because the Adam and Eve question for me is not an essential. Okay, uh, I I I don't think macro revolution macro revolution is true for uh, reasons outside the Bible. I don't care what the Bible. I do care what the Bible says about it, but I, if I didn't have the Bible, I wouldn't think Mac Revolution was true, okay? Uh, and, and I think what Bill is saying is, let's, for the sake of argument, say it is true. Mm -hmm. Do we still have an historical Adam? And according to what I've heard of him saying is that if you go back far enough, yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, that's all he's saying, okay? Uh, but I haven't read the book, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to comment any further on it. I have a lot of respect for him. I've learned a lot from him, and uh, I, I trust his judgment in so many ways. But I may read the book and go, I don't agree with it. Do okay. you think us as believers should focus in more on the topic, though, than we on do? On which topic? Um, topics of archaeology and, and evolutionism. and uh, Oh, we can study it, and we do. And, and I've personally studied it, but I rely on people who are way smarter than me in those specialty topics on biology, people like, uh, uh, like Stephen Meyer and, uh, and Casey Luskin and uh, other people at the Discovery Institute who do great work there. So, uh, but I don't think macro evolution is true on the merits, regardless of what the Bible says okay. about it. Appreciate you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Hi, I'm Brandon. Hey, Brandon. I have a legal question, actually. Oh, gee. <laughs> I, I, I'm not the attorney, so. <laughs> so all my legal classes tell me that laws are made to set the minimum standard of acceptable behavior. Um, that All laws are made in what way? To set the minimum standard of acceptable behavior. Okay. That you shall not kill, you shall not steal. Right. Um, anything higher would be actually dangerous to assume that you have that knowledge to actually create or interpret a law beyond the minimal standard that it can trample on freedom. Uh-huh. Um, like I said, the, all my legal professors also say that the best type of law when it comes to religion is that when religion is not involved because to create a law for religion in a nation that has so many types of faith, it can open up Pandora's box. Yeah, for some reason, my professor thought she was funny and put me on the opposite side of this argument for a project, and I have no clue where to begin to even argue against it. What position does she want you to take? Uh, to argue that laws should incorporate religion matters. Religious should matters. incorporate religion. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a moral position right there. 
Why are you saying it should or should not incorporate religion? She By what standard would you say that? Okay. Right? Yeah, that's the first thing you want to ask. Okay? Uh, I think our country had the perfect balance. You see, with Jefferson and, the, and his colleagues came to the United States or came to the colonies to avoid having a denominational government where you had to be a member of the Church of England. They wanted to get away from that. But they knew the other extreme where if you had no religious expression or no religious uh, anchor at all would lead to uh, having no objective moral values. So what Jefferson said was, we're going to base this government on God's nature, but we're going to also have freedom of religion. That way we can have God-given moral rights without saying you have to be a member of a particular church. So we will legislate morality, but we will not legislate religion. You see, there's a difference. Okay. And you don't need to legislate religion per se to have laws like the Ten Commandments, like thou shall not murder, steal, particularly the second table of the Ten Commandments, right? So when people say don't impose your religion on me, I say I'm not. I'm imposing morality. Now, those two come from the same source, God, but every government has to ground its mor or, or its laws in some sort of moral principle. What moral principle are you going to ground it in? Let's, why don't we ground it in God's nature and still allow religious freedom? That would be the route I would take. Okay. The other question she had was, should you define law by human morality and not any type of religious morality? That's a moral position right there. Okay. Right? Why? Why are you saying that? If it's just human morality, in other words, it's just my opinion... Why should I impose that on other people? Is it wrong to impose on other people? I'm, a, I'm still then appealing to a standard beyond all this. You're always appealing to a standard beyond whenever you say should or shouldn't, unless you're just talking about a pragmatic kind of thing, right? So I would just keep questioning, well, why do you think that's true? What standard are you using to even say that? Should or shouldn't, those are moral terms. What's the purpose of life? What's the objective? So you can keep digging on here, and you're going to just annoy her to the end, okay? <laughs> because you're going to have all these questions. Oh, well, I already do. So. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, can I quote you on this? Uh, you can quote, yeah, sure. Perfect, thank you. There's a, book that, there's a book that I wrote a number of years ago with Norman Geisler. It's called Legislating Morality. It gets into this if you want some sources on it. Perfect, thank you so right. much. Thanks, Brandon. Mm -hmm. God bless. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Sam. Hey, uh, Sam. And I was uh, wondering what you think, what exactly your explanation for uh, Sheol in the Bible is. Sheol, the place of uh, the departed. Yes. Right. Well, there are some things uh, that the Bible talks about that I think uh, people have different opinions on. One is Sheol, the, part, uh, the, the, the area of the departed or the place where souls go after... Uh, they die here. And then there's Hades. I, uh, some say that's a, the, the same kind of place. Others might say it's a different place. And then there's Abraham's bosom, right? Mm. Now, we talk about heaven and hell. Like people die, they go to heaven. But technically, that's not true. When they die now, according to Paul, they're absent from the body present with the Lord. But you know what heaven is? Heaven is a remade heavens and earth it's a remade physical place where our souls and our bodies will be reunited heaven hasn't actually been created yet so uh so you're saying that nobody nobody's actually in heaven right now because it's, it's technically no okay. but they're with the lord and we can say well the lord's in heaven but it's not the final heaven the final heaven will be a remade heaven and earth okay all right okay. so it's a little bit murky in the Old Testament as to where people are, although they're somewhere. Why? Because, well, one reason we know is Elijah and Moses come back and are transfigured with Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who's taken straight to heaven? Elijah, right? Yeah, um, Enoch, I yeah, yeah, and uh, Enoch. And then what happens when David's baby dies? David says, I will go to him. He will not come to me, but I will go to him. Mm -hmm. There's also some Psalms which talk about the afterlife. Daniel 12 talks about a, a final resurrection. So it's spoken of in the Old Testament, but it's much clearer in the New. Okay. Thank All right. You. Thank you. All right. What time we got here? Well, all right. Just a few more. Then we got to go because it'll be morning. Go ahead. Hey, Frank. My name's Dan. 
Hey, Dan. If I give you to the end of the night, can I get you to sign a book for me? Uh, actually, Clint has better penmanship than me, so he can sign it. Where is he? No, I'd be happy to do it. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, sir. My name's Bruce. Um, I got just two quick questions. Yes, sir. So, you know, obviously in Islam, they believe in various rewards when you die. You kind of be given by to God. Or by God. They believe in what now? I guess in various rewards like food or virgins. The virgins, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of that nature. Well, yeah. also in, in the Bible, they mention rewards as well, you know. And yeah. I guess my question is, what would those rewards be? And also, if we're all sinners and Jesus right. is a standard, then how can some people get more rewards than others? You know, if, it, if we're all or not perfect by no means. Yeah, it's, uh, the, Paul talks about the fact that you will get more crowns in heaven. There's a crown up in heaven waiting for me kind of thing. Uh, and I'm going to lay, lay these crowns at God's feet. I think that we get into heaven based on trusting in Christ because of his sacrifice. But our place in heaven or are the rewards in heaven are based on the good works that we do that are motivated by the Holy Spirit. Second, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, that God prepares us to do good works. Uh, but, and the but reason no, that happens no is... No good deeds outweigh another good deed, right? Like yes, was, yeah, it can. Okay. Uh, obviously, the Apostle Paul will have more rewards than, than we will because yeah. he deserves okay. them, but th that's because God is just. Okay. It's been looked at it this way. Um, Think about someone who might be a 60-watt bulb and somebody who might be a 1,000-watt bulb, right? Mm. The 60-watt bulb is going to be glorified based on what they've done, but the 1,000-watt bulb will also be glorified just to a greater extent, but they're both going to be in heaven. Okay. Right. And my other quick question is, I know in the 1,000-year reign, I think they, uh -huh. they mentioned the Revelation, yeah. that uh, God is going to lock up the devil. Uh -huh. Okay. So... In that time, what will, I guess, humans be doing while he's got it kind of raining on earth? But why would he just destroy the devil at that time? Like, why is he locking him up? Why doesn't he destroy him right now? Uh, and the reason is, question, is yeah. because God is patient. God gives us all free will. Why doesn't he destroy us right now? I mean, so, if God were to end evil tonight at midnight, would, we, would any of us still be alive at 1201? No. God still has work to do. The reason that, that the devil's still loose right now is because the full number of the Gentiles hasn't come in yet. The reason why we're still here right now is because the full number of Gentiles hasn't come in yet. Romans chapter 11. When is Jesus coming back? When the full number of the Gentiles comes in. When is that? Nobody knows. Right? Now, there's so many different views on eschatology and revelation. I just know we win, on the in, uh, we win in the end. Look, I'm, I'm on the welcoming committee. I'm not on the planning committee. Okay, so I'm just going to welcome Christ whenever he comes and say thank you. But how this is going to happen and when, I don't know. And in fact, if you want to read a really good intellectual um, expose of Revelation, listen to Michael Heiser's Naked Bible podcast, which in the past six or eight months, he's been going through the book of Revelation verse by verse. And he doesn't take a firm view on eschatology. He's just trying to give you the best insights possible on the book of Revelation. So check that out. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Hello, Dr. Turk. My name is uh, Yavuz. Two quick comments and then my actual question. First off, I don't know if you know this, but unofficially our reasonable faith end time is roughly around, or duration is roughly around six or seven hours of just talking about all kinds of things. So you're in it for the long run here with wow. us at UTD. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Second thing, I think you I think you using a football analogy to a bunch of UTD students is very apt. Our UTD football team is as everyone knows is undefeated. I've heard that. Yeah. So, yeah, they're unvictorious too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> so my actual question was um we know that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead for our sins. Mm -hmm. A lot of people might ask, okay, why does why would he do that? The Christian answer would be, oh, because justice demands that somebody pay for your sins. Mm -hmm. There cannot be, you know, it, it, if, it incur, if, a, if a debt is incurred, you'd want somebody to pay the debt. Mm -hmm. The question that I have, or the question that I've been facing recently was, why is that the case? Why would 
the debt even, why would debt even be defined as to be paid for in the first place? Why does God's justice, it's not really why does God justice demands that it happen, it's that why is justice such that, you know, blood is required for the remission of sins? Why is that the case? Why is blood required for the remission of sins? I think that's a Be verse in the because Bible. Because you need a representative to represent the flesh and blood person who has sinned. Either it's going to be that person or an innocent substitute. Otherwise, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. The question was more so, why is that the case? Why is it? The, the, I, I guess the idea could be like, why doesn't God just forgive everybody just because? Okay, well, let me, uh, let me ask you a question. Let's suppose uh, someone borrows your car, right? And he goes and he smashes up your car. And he gets out of the car and he goes, sorry, dude. And you go, you're forgiven. Someone still has to pay for the car, right? Yes. Okay. So when a sin occurs, someone still has to pay. Either you can absorb that payment yourself by paying for the repairs yourself, or you can ask him to do it. Or somebody else can come in between you and say, I'll pay for it. Which would be great. Yeah, that's what God does. He comes in and says, I'll pay. Someone has to pay because someone's at a loss. It's either going to be you, it's going to be the other sinner, or it's going to be someone who's going to intervene and say, I'll handle it. But someone still has to pay. Sure, I think that satisfies yeah. the question. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, my name's Abigail. Hey, Abigail. Um, I just have one question, uh -huh. and I would like to say that I really love your books and your podcasts. I've oh, thank you. To every single one of them. Um, my question is, is, it's for a friend. She believes in works-based salvation. Uh-huh. Um, so why does that not work? And like, why, why can't good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell, you know, type thing? Okay, well, first of all, what do you mean by good, right? And then when Jesus was called, uh, oh, good teacher, Jesus asked the rich young ruler, what do you mean by good? Or why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God. So if someone claims they're a good person, they're either lying or they're claiming to be God, okay? And I don't know where we get this idea that somehow good deeds outweigh bad deeds or cancel bad deeds, right? I'll go back to the analogy we had earlier. Somebody smashes up your car deliberately, but then they help an old lady across the street. Are they off the hook for smashing up your car? No. No. Someone needs to pay. Or to give another analogy, let's suppose you uh, are, you're, I know you wouldn't do this, but let's say you're caught drunk driving and... Uh, you're in a town with swift justice. They take you right to the courtroom. You're still drunk. And you look up and the, the judge is your father, your physical earthly father. And he looks down at you and he says, how do you plead? And you plead guilty because you're drunk now. They've got the goods on you. They've got the breathalyzer. You say, Dad, I'm guilty. And your father says, well, let me ask you this. As, since your father is supposed to be a just judge, can he just look down at you and say, well, she's my daughter. Let her go. Can he do that? No. If he's going to be just, he says, look, $5,000 fine or you go to jail. And you look at him and you go, well, Dad, I don't have $5,000, but from now on I'll be good forever. I'll help old ladies across the street. I'll help down at the soup kitchen. I'll do whatever Mom says. I'll clean up my room. I'll, I'll, I'll stay off social media. I'll do all the stuff you want me to do, Dad. At that point, your dad's going to say, are you still drunk? Because that's not going to matter anyway. Look, $5,000 fine, you go to jail. And then you say, Dad, you know I don't have $5,000. And so he goes, hang on. He comes out from around his bench. He takes off his robes, reaches into his pocket. He takes out $5,000. What's the only thing you can do to be free? Take the $5,000. Take the $5,000, right? Good works aren't going to change the fact that you're in debt $5,000. All you can do is take it as a gift. Well, that's what God does for us. He comes down from heaven. He adds humanity to his deity, and he takes our punishment on himself. And all we need to do is accept it. Good works aren't going to change any of that. If you've conducted any bad works, and we all have, that's on your record forever. The good works you do from here on out aren't going to cancel those. It wouldn't even work in a court of law. Yeah, but I've been a pretty, I know I murdered those people, but I've been a pretty good person otherwise. No, you still got to pay for what you've done. Thank that you. makes sense? Hopefully that answered her question. All right. I was also wondering, can you sign my book? Yes, I can, but I won't. No, I will. I'll do it. <laughs> 
Oh, Oklahoma, okay, absolutely. Let me get this question, and then I'll be happy to do it. Just a minute. I should have brought my book. I got some books from you. I regret not All doing All right, that. go ahead, so Dylan. I'm going to have you sign this, if you're willing. All right. But anyway, um, I was talking with a friend last night, and she wanted, I didn't know what questions to ask, um, and so I asked her, and she wanted you to interpret this verse. Uh-huh. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Uh-huh. Um, well, you have to look at the whole context of that. Uh, so I'd have to look at the whole context of 1 John 4 at that point. And I know in 1 John 3 is the beatific yeah. vision, that one day we will see him as he is. And what see means, not necessarily with our eyes, because God's an immaterial being, but we will get the full sensation of, or knowledge of, what, of who God is. Yeah. Uh, so 1 John 4, no one has ever seen God, but what? What does it say after that, Dylan? But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Well, the Holy Spirit lives through us. We're given a new heart when we become a believer, technically, and we're supposed to, because of what God has done for us, out of gratitude, live in a way that would be pleasing to him. So we're expressing ourselves uh, by the heart he's given us, by the Holy Spirit that has been given us. We're living by the Spirit now. We're not living by the flesh anymore. Yeah. In fact, I was reading a verse this morning. Is Romans 7. I want to say it's verse... Was it 12 or 19? Anyone have Romans 7? You got Romans 7 there? It says something about the pattern of your... Uh, look in the NIV, the Nearly Inspired Version. And um, there's, some, there's something there about the pattern of your belief. Is it Romans 7, 12? It's somewhere early in Romans 7. No, that's a little bit later. It's earlier in Romans 7. I just read it this morning, and it struck me as, uh, it struck me as that's a big step. It struck me. I think you're thinking too much about bacon, Frank. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Uh, holy and righteous. Uh, it's too late. It's like 1 a.m. body time, so I, I can't remember where I saw this. Uh, we serve in the way of the Spirit, not the written code. Uh, that wasn't it. I'm sorry, I can't. I can't find it right now. It's all good. Um, On that note. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, man. Without going into detail, um, I've been struggling with sin, uh-huh. a particular area. Sure. Uh, now, I know as believers that there's 10 million and a half reasons that we turn away from that, and I do and I try, um, and obviously it'll never be perfect, but what's that, what's that journey look like, man, of overcoming sin as a believer and uh, turn away from that and developing a new heart because one thing I've learned is that you can't change yourself obviously if you pray God will answer you and honor that and he'll help change you and that process can be instant or it can be over time but well this the the shocking like answer to this people, question I, the shocking answer to this question is not what you expect but it's from Galatians chapter 3 when Paul says are you trying to um, continue what you started with the spirit through the flesh in other words, are, are you trying to become sanctified through the law now when you should continue to be sanctified the same way that you became justified? And that is through the Spirit. You accept what Christ has done, and then out of gratitude for what he's done, you live according to his will. It's not, oh, I got all these laws I got to follow now, and that's the way I'm going to please yeah. God. Do you realize you can't make God love you more already? Yeah. Because he's an infinite being, he loves you the most he does already. And you can't get him to love you less by cursing him. He's an infinite being. Yeah. You don't help him by praising him. You don't hurt him by cursing him. We're the ones to get the benefit of, of praising him yeah. and the detriment of cursing him. Yeah. So the way we're supposed to become sanctified is by following the spirit 
which means that you have to be attuned to the Spirit, which means you do have to do things. You do have to read. You do have to pray. You do have to meditate. You do have to be with other believers. You do have to set boundaries that are around yourself so you're not sucked in. In fact, you're not enticed and dragged away, says James. Enticed and dragged away. This is like being caught in a trap or being caught on a hook and dragged away. Yeah. And you do that by putting boundaries around yourself to protect you from that. Okay. Read the book of Proverbs. Don't even go down that street where that lady is. Yeah. Right? First chapter or second chapter, I think, where yeah. it talks about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And it's like four or five chapters about that specific right. one, right. which is, anyway. Right, uh, and, and unfortunately in, today, in today's society, you don't have to go down the street. You can get it on your phone. Yeah, Right. anytime and you want. And so if that's a problem, Get rid of the phone or get something on the phone that'll prevent you from going there. So, what's that new thing I just heard? It's, huh? Not Covenant Eyes. It's been around a long time. There was something else I tweeted out last week about it. It was something like uh, a canopy against porn or something. Or I can't remember. Um, anyway. Yeah. I think it's funny that people actually think that uh, participating that's okay, but... That's All right, thanks, fun. Dylan. I got to go because yeah, I'm really it, tired. So thanks, let me man. just grab these last couple and then we'll all go to bed. All right. Yes, sir. All right, um, my name is John, and my question is that um, if God saves us from sins, why didn't he uh, protect us from sinnings? If right. God saves us from sins, what? Uh, why, if God saved us from sins, then why didn't he protect us from uh, sinning? Protect us from sinning ourselves or from other yeah. people hurting us through sin. Yeah. What do you mean? Like, okay. All right, I'm going to go to the next question, actually. Uh, so my, um, actually, my next question is, uh, why didn't God destroy or kill uh, Satan? Like, oh, in the first okay, place? yeah. That actually, goes back to what we said earlier, true. that uh, God, if he wanted to destroy evil, he could, but he would take away our free will to do so, and Satan's free will as well. So God thought it was better to create a moral universe where we could make choices. And one of the benefits of a moral universe is that redemption is better than innocence. You say, what does that mean? I'll give you a business analogy for this. I know it's not the best analogy, but surveys of businesses show that if a customer has a really bad experience with a company, and then the company goes above and beyond the call of duty. To fix that relationship, that customer is more devoted to that company than if the problem never occurred. Why? Because if you're the state of innocence and that problem happens, if you're rescued out of that problem, you're more loyal to that company than you were if you had never had the problem. The same is true when it comes to relationships. If you fall away from the Lord and then he redeems you out of that, you're more grateful to him than you would have been if you never fell away. Now, we don't fall away in order to get a better redemption, but we all do fall away. And so a redeemed relationship is actually deeper and richer than a relationship that never had a problem. I thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm David, and uh, his question kind of answered some of mine, but um, so in Hebrew, the word Satan means accuser, yes. and I've read that uh, some Jews think that he is kind of something of an agent of God that is sent to tempt us, but then in James, it says God does not tempt anyone. Right. So then I've seen a lot of uh, Christian theology uh, seeing Satan as something of like a fallen angel that has free mm -hmm. will. Is that your view? He is a fallen angel. And Satan metaphysically is good. There's no metaphysically evil being because even Satan has good things. He has mind, emotion, and will. He just uses it for his own selfish means rather than for God's means or for God's ends, I should say. Uh, so this is why, as C.S. Lewis famously pointed out, strict dualism doesn't work. Like the yin and the yang, God and Satan are not opposite and equal forces. Satan derives all of his power from God. You can have all goodness without evil, but you can't have evil unless there's some goodness associated with it. Because, as we mentioned earlier, 
Evil is just spoiled goodness. It's a parasite in good. So Satan has good qualities, mind, emotion, and will. Those are good things, but he uses them for his own evil ends. And Satan's trying to get good things when he does evil, just like us, right? We're trying to get, for us, in this, spirit, I mean, in this physical world, we're trying to get sex, money, and power. Those are good things. We don't do evil to get evil. We do evil to get good. There would be no motivation to do evil if there was nothing good. Of course, there'd be no evil anyway. There'd be nothing if there was no good. That's why ultimate reality is goodness. Like people say, well, couldn't God be evil? No, because you wouldn't even know what evil was unless good existed, and you wouldn't know what good was unless God existed. By definition, God is what we mean by the greatest good. If he doesn't exist, there, could be, there couldn't be a devil. There couldn't be a Satan. Satan's deriving his power from God. And God allows it, just like we're deriving our power from God. People say, why doesn't God stop Satan? Why doesn't God stop you? Why doesn't God stop me? Because he's patient and he knows the end from the beginning. He knows how it's all going to work out. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, last question of the night. Explain God and give two examples. <laughs> Hi there. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> uh, I'm Christian. My name's Christian. Hey, Christian. Well. But, um, I just want to say thank you. I know this is a very thankless job, and I really appreciate what you do. We studied you in uh, high school in apologetics class. Oh, you good. Were, like our main source, so I appreciate all that Where'd you, you go do. to school? Uh, Prestonwood Christian. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lady here that was going there right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. actually came together. Well, good. Me and oh. Avery. But uh, I had a quick question. I know you got to go. But uh, I, I'm very interested in apologetics, and I've done a lot of uh, study on the matter especially uh -huh. stuff that you've covered. And one area that I have been asked about and I've just thought on my own, uh, as far as the potential of Jesus being any kind of extraterrestrial, I've never really heard a lot of questions asked about that. And a lot of people think it's silly, which is why nobody gives a straight answer about it. But do you have any, like, two sentences about it or so? Yeah, he, he was. How do you take? He came from heaven. <laughs> right? He didn't come from outer space, he came from heaven. So he, as John says in John chapter 1, he is the word that became flesh. So the, the God of the universe took on human flesh. So he did come from outer space, if you want to say, outside of the space-time continuum into this world. But what, was he an alien? No. No. He was, and, and if someone wants to say that, I'm going to say, what evidence do you have for that? Man, because this alien came to earth and he taught us the most sublime teachings and said he sacrificed himself to save us. Uh, gee, I want to follow this alien, but what evidence do you have he's an alien? I mean, remember, when somebody says something, it's not your job to refute what they say. It's their job to support what they say. So why do you say he's an alien? I, and then, I completely understand. Yeah. yeah, and then you would have to say, well, who created him? Because, again, the law of causality says everything that comes to be has to have a cause. Um, if he's eternal, then he's not an alien. Uh, because, ultimately, Jesus in his human nature is a composed being. And any composed being has to be put together by a composer. And you can't go on an infinite regress of composers. Ultimately, you're going to get back to an uncomposed composer. This is another reason we know that God is immaterial. Because everything material is composed. So ultimately, you're going to get back to an uncomposed composer. So an alien is still a composed being that would need a cause outside of himself. Yeah, I understand. I appreciate it. All right. Are you available for a picture at the end? Yeah, sure. I, we're at the end, so let's do it. Oh, cool. All right. Thanks, Thank folks.